why do people spend so much energy trying to learn that magic combination of how to, you know, put one plus two plus three, you know, and get this equation happening when they're focused outward rather than inward, not realizing that by focusing inward, you transform yourself into the kind of person who, once you're in range of somebody who's available and, and might be interested in you, they're more likely to be attracted to you. So how do you transform yourself into that kind of person who is, first of all, that you feel personally worthy of the kind of love that you really want? And you've taken some time to be realistic about what it is you're asking for, to check to see is it unrealistic or not? Yeah. Um, I, I believe that theoretically speaking, a person could have anything they wanted, more or less. But to consistently get that, certain principles are involved. For example, hmm. studies have shown that people tend to uh, attract people within one or two points of attractiveness to themselves. Uh, so sort to, of a mating? Yeah, so to, so to try to get someone who's four points above where you would be might happen also might not last or you might there might be other problems that come along with that um on both sides and it could end up being that there's an actual reason for that that we attract kind of people who are more or less as attractive as we are uh so then you know yes uh, sometimes there's a confidence issue and we we just don't go for people who we find very attractive because we don't feel worthy and that that's also true but beauty is in the eye of the beholder so the things that we find attractive can shift along the way and even our own perception of what we find attractive in ourselves uh, can change as we learn to appreciate our uniqueness and to recognize that it's about more than physical looks it's about the overall impression that we give uh, posture makes uh, for a lot of it hygiene makes for a lot of it um, fashion can make for a lot of it humor uh, kindness, the ability to actually be kind to people, <laughs> to genuinely be kind, not fake nice, but actual kindness. You want to have somebody who's not going to screw you over, that is, because you might want someone to screw you, but not screw you over. Um, then you need, you need to make sure that person is kind because a kind person would rather be honest and, you know, have you know work out their problem with you or or leave, even if they were to leave you they would leave you in a more honest way and they wouldn't screw you over so kindness is a huge factor if you don't know how to identify kindness then that's should that should be in the foundation of your dating training all right guys welcome back to another episode the little dude with the attitude coming back at you and i am super excited i mean we've already been talking for a good 30 minutes before hitting record but uh as you guys know i am studying neurolinguistic programming it's helped me out a lot um i can't wait to tell the full story about that and because of that i met some great interesting people but today on this podcast we're going to be learning from Carlos. I'm not going to spoil it. I'm going to let him talk, but he's going to teach us not only how to be a better person, but me specifically, how to improve my jujitsu skills. So with that said, I'm going to shut up and I'm going to let Carlos introduce himself. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to be here. Um, I appreciate that you asked me to come on. And, uh, and so, you know, my name is Carlos Casados and I am a longtime martial arts practitioner and uh, NLP fanatic, <laughs> hypnotist, um, all around um, learning freak, I guess you could say. Um, I have an avid lifelong interest in self-development, and that has led me down a lot of really interesting alleys. And I have learned quite a lot. Uh, mostly I've learned that it's endless and that it'll never end. And there will always be more that I, that I need to learn. That's like the biggest thing. And I'm not trying to be cutesy or cliche when I say that it's really true because um, 
Zhuangzi, the Taoist philosopher, um, probably, I don't know, 1500 to 2000 years ago, said something like, life has a limit, knowledge has none. To pursue the unlimited with the limited is foolish. So every day in the pursuit of knowledge, something is gained. Every day in the pursuit of the Tao or the way, something is lost. I we, will. Lose, we lose the ideas, the bad ideas or the ideas that are less than helpful, the ideas that are get, keeping us stuck, the things that are blocking us. Um, and it makes way for something special that's inside of us, a core quality, something that maybe doesn't require learning. So we're learning to unlearn. It's a very Taoist kind of idea that, that the, the learning can sometimes be the problem itself. Because learning is, learning is um, not just the things that you think of as academic subjects or skills. Learning can be learning to be an asshole, <laughs> learning to be uh, hurt by things, learning to feel frustrated, learning to eat poorly or to have uh, terrible health habits. That's also learning. It's just not the kind of learning that promotes better health and uh, more success. So sometimes we have to unlearn habits. All right. I, I can't help it, but you brought it up and it's, it ties in perfectly with what we were talking about before I hit record. And I think I would have been further in life if I would have understood that. Mm. And it's specifically what we're talking about, like, you and me both, brother. <laughs> All right, like, yeah. oh, man, the older you get, the more you're like, oh, if I knew this earlier. But um, yep. I told you, the, re the, the first time I got introduced to neuro linguistic programming was years ago. Uh, and it was learning how to do party tricks to impress w uh, women. <laughs> and it worked. You know what I'm saying? It worked. One of the many applications of NLP. <laughs> it, exactly. But as you could tell, yeah. it gets generalize like this is the only thing you could do with this instead of sure. change work healing all that but if i knew those other aspects of it i would have been healed faster i would have been changed faster but i vote i would say i was a great student wrong avenue because mm -hmm. i could tell you i mean if you could see my old, and I'm, I'm not trying to brag because there's people that are way better than me. But if you can see one of my old wingmen and people that used to hang out with me, they're like, you're super charismatic. You know how to talk to anybody. And it was true. Like, there was times, and like I said, I want to brag, but I'm 5'3". I am not the tallest. I mean, I think a baby's taller than me right now. But, <laughs> <clears throat> and it takes a lot of learning of how to get over that and how to, like, move into a crowd with women that are wearing heels, heels, and then you got to look at her, and yes, you got to look up, if you're my height, mm. and then, like, talk her panties off. And that's what I knew about NLP. I never knew there was a different side of it, and I wish I learned that side of it, and it was more popular. I never knew Tony Robbins, that's what he was doing. I thought he was doing some gimmicky, like, oh, yeah, walk on coals, and you'll change his life. And I was like, I think that's BS. I'm not even going to touch that so um i didn't want to touch on that until maybe another episode but guys <laughs> i think the best way to solve this manosphere red pill issue is to find out the real purpose of nop and use it to heal yourself not to trick people and do these party tricks i would have been way further financially physically mentally spiritually all over if i knew the real purpose Rant over, by the way. Sorry. Hey, you know, people come to personal growth and various, you know, topics like NLP uh, through many different directions and many different avenues. So you found it and that's what, what matters most. Um, but, you know, what, what you're speaking to is, is kind of a maybe a more common than people realize is, is that, uh, you know, people look for the tricks, they look for the uh, the candy and they don't ask themselves what's you know, what's the nutritive aspect, you know, what, where's the meat and potatoes or the veggies. If you're, if you happen to be vegan, uh, you know, where's the, where's the nutrients, 
in this. Um, otherwise, um, you know, most people are kind of stick on the surface. They don't really penetrate down into the depths of what it's really about. And that's true for martial arts. It's true for, um, you know, esoteric studies of any kind uh, and, and any kind of real skill. You know, skill requires uh, a deep dive and, and it requires um, dedication and it requires a lot of failure and it requires the willingness to, to fail over and over again. And because you love it so much, you know, that you, you are engrossed in what it is that you're focused on. Um, there's no way around that, um, mm. you know. So, so yeah, there there are a lot of different approaches to NLP, and I think when it comes to what you called, you you taught me the term manosphere. I, I didn't know that term existed, but yeah, you no, know, um, it's a great term. Um, I think people are seeking to feel whole. At the bottom line, they're seeking to feel whole. They they feel there's something missing. They feel empty maybe they don't feel like they're worthy or they're good enough or whatever. And, and it's a, it's, I would say on a continuum of growth, that's a step in the right direction. It may not be um, the most positive place to stop, <laughs> if you will. But if you started there, there's no sense in feeling shame about it. Like that's the beginning of moving towards finding wholeness. You realize eventually that it's not about, talking a girl's panties off per se, uh, although initially that might seem like the most important thing. Um, eventually you might start to look at yourself and listen to yourself more and start to recognize um, that some of what you're doing is not authentic. Maybe it's not, um, it's not in alignment with what your stated values are. You know, maybe you start to, to recognize that there's a cognitive dissonance between uh, what you really feel in your heart and what you've been thinking in your head. You know, these are all just examples, but, you know, when you start to learn some patterns, eventually those patterns start to bounce back. You start to hear yourself say it. You start to see yourself in the mirror or you meet someone else, uh, you know, God forbid, a woman who's actually very centered and grounded and intelligent and knows what she's doing. And she asks you, uh, very good questions about where you're coming from and what your motivations are and how do you know that's true? And all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, that's not how the script worked. How come it's not, you know, what's going on? And then, and then the guy feels embarrassed, but rightfully so. That's also part of growth, right? Recognizing that you don't have it all figured out. And, and a woman like that can be a blessing for a man because she can wake him up. And if you look at the bigger picture of how we, you know, respect the feminine and masculine dynamics, that can be one of the components of the so-called divine feminine. You know, when we talk about divinity, right? The highest aspects of, of a woman is, is the capacity to really show us our highest self. Ooh. So there's another way to take this, you know, to really, I'm getting shivers when I said it, sorry. Um, but no, there's keep really going, that, keep going. You know, it's, respect for a woman is respect for yourself because you came from a fucking woman. You know what I mean? Like you can't deny that. Like your mother was feminine. So you, you have no respect for, for women. You don't respect yourself. So let me, and, let me, you know, I'm sorry. Let me translate it because I know like, uh, it's going to sound corny. It's going to sound the way it's going to sound, but I'm not, I'm not to translate it in manosphere speak because you're sounding, okay. you sound a <laughs> real blue pill right now. I don't know if you know what blue pill is. And I like you I watched know, the Matrix. I'll explain it a little bit, um, guys. I apologize for the lighting. I broke one of my lights in the last interview because it was a face-to-face -face interview. Um, and the you were grappling. You knocked it, it out. It, it was with a grappler, and then <laughs> the camera ended up dying anyway. Like it was, it was funky. It was, it was crazy. So the recording, the video is gone, but we got the mm. audio. Mm -hmm. But it cost my light, so that's why the light keeps going darker and, and dim anyway. But I'm kind of liking it. I'm getting hypnotized by it. I, well, you know, that's what we study, so I was hoping that <laughs> like my audience could, you know, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, get hypnotized to do that, and follow <laughs> me back, and follow Carlos on his website. Everything is going to be in the description below. But to translate what you said, 
because if, if I show this to some of the people that I know, because there's a lot of good, intelligent people in both camps, in any camps, really, is that sometimes course. they're misdirected. Um, so you sound real blue pill, and blue pill in the manosphere is that you're still plugged into the matrix. You still think either that society uh, is like this Disney fairy tale thing, and women are like this Disney princess and you know you could save them um and you don't realize that like society you know it's all men for themselves it's life is unfair which is true like life is unfair i'm not saying that is not true but uh generalizing characteristics of male and female because of these beliefs is where the blue the, the term blue pill comes from oh you're gonna get abused from a woman because you're still thinking that they're these beautiful unicorn so you got oh i feel sorry for you the next turn will be red pill somebody's unplugged from the matrix that's like a red pill is like somebody that would never get married because they don't believe either that true love exists that's one camp that women is trustworthy enough to be married that's another camp that the legal system is fair enough for men that's where i stand thank goodness my girlfriend is in the same boat because of her previous relationship where it's like kind of like if we split ways or something happens sometimes legal systems could be really bad my sister is living case she's going through a bad divorce right now and then the last camp would be um honestly being truthful you never get married because nobody really wants to be with you so that's red pill uh -huh. question just a question um so i tend to have I tend to have um, a quality inside of me that always, you know, kind of resists this sort of uh, either or presupposition. Um, I would be more likely to agree that I'm a gray pill person because I don't identify with things exactly as you put it when you put the, the blue pill, even if that is the paradigm. Um, I... I see that both can be true at times, but I don't subscribe to either one, red or blue. Uh, so in order to encapsulate that idea, I would say I'm more of a gray pill person. And that's just how I've been since I was a child. So there are certain aspects of it, which I do um, search for and see and, and, and perceive, but I also recognize what, counter examples have shown up in my life as well i mean i would love to dive in super deep on that, that because yes because the I, counter I examples is what is missing in a lot of these groups yeah both the feminist and the extreme masculine group yes. counter examples of their generalization all women are this all men are that really right you got any camp but sorry to interrupt like it's yeah. something i'm passionate about too absolutely you know, you and and very, very rarely does, does life fit into perfectly one camp or another. I mean, look at our political system right now. I mean, exactly. come on, really? Like, that's going to encapsulate all there is, just Democrat and Republican. That's really what's going to encapsulate it? No. Um, life's gotten very complicated. And, you know, both liberal ideals and conservative ideals um, have various applications which i might agree with one then in the other and then the other then the other depending on which which thing we're talking about mm -hmm. uh, and you, you, know, you so. when we build a false dichotomy like that is what causes like our camp versus their camp when, yes like you said we could be like you know what i like a couple of these ideas these ideas could stay behind this works for me and what pill you will be because there is a term like that there's purple pill purple pill oh, they call it purple pill okay He's exactly. after yeah. blue and, and, and red. I'm more in the purple pill camp now because I'm in a relationship. But mm -hmm. for a long time, I was, I started off in the blue pill, not knowing, red pill. And for the longest time, I might, I've been single for seven years. Like I had a really good run, a really good run. Uh, and, and now, like, you know what? I found somebody that ideologically has the ide same values I have. And the cool thing is that I discovered them before I had to elicit my values. I was like, oh, you believe in this before I even have to see if you believe in this. Uh, 
like the marriage thing, you know, saying um certain certain you know religious ideals and stuff. So now I'm like okay with being in a relationship with a person like that. According to the red pill community, that's a no no. According to the blue pill community, that's your destiny, and you should make sure that you wake up licking her feet every day and make sure that she has everything that she needs to empower her as a woman because you're nothing but a useless man. That's blue pill, by the way. And mm -hmm. some people believe that. Like, there's articles of why you need to be a beta male, why you need to be beneath her. And I'm like, great, good luck finding a woman that will respect you if you have that mentality. You could yeah. communicate with her, work with her, be beneath her. You can keep with that one. False dichotomy is exactly what that creates. You know, this idea that there has to be only two and this has to be divided and that people are unable to um, make individual choices or decide along the way or uh, adjust along the way. And that's the thing is, is, you know, you could say that there's a kind of a spiral of transformations that happens the more you learn and you, you revisit, um, you know, earlier versions of your beliefs, but at, at a higher octave level, you could say like another, uh, another version of it um, until that no longer serves you, you know, but change happens along the way, uh, mostly because of a problem. So if you're running into a problem, uh, that necessitates you finding a different way because it cracks the, the foundation of what it is that you had previous to that. But if there's no problem to that, to, to the, the approach you're using, and, and, and you won't challenge yourself to do anything differently, and you don't need to. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Mm -hmm. But at each point when you go through a growth cycle, when you look backwards, that's when you can examine and see and refract what it was that you gained from that, both positive and negative. Um, I think it was Soren Kierkegaard that said, we understand our life in reverse, but we have to live it forward. Mm -hmm. And that's very true. We talk about having the hindsight 2020, you know, looking back and that's very true. Um, but you know, with regard to what I said about a divine feminine, it's a metaphor. You can take it however you want. I take a look at any lesson that transforms me as categorized in a divine way, profound way. So whether it's um, any kind of negative experience like a loss, a deep loss, the grief of, of, a, of a death that happens, or a woman that could wake me up through asking the right questions, as I mentioned earlier, or even uh, the toxicity that happens in a relationship that, that I say, you know what, that almost destroyed me. That's awful. And I never want to have that happen ever again. And it was abusive and terrible. And, and I'm appalled by her behavior or, or her choices along the way, I can also choose to use that, the pain around that to help me transform. And it doesn't mean I have to label all women because of even a repeated experience. My anecdotal experience with the, you know, limited number of women that I've been with in my life is still my anecdotal experience with a limited data set. It's not possible to make, um, gross generalizations about all women based upon my limited data set. All I can do is talk about my approach and me, what's worked. I'm and sorry. Uh, let me jump in real quick sure. to do another little manosphere translation or whatever, because some people might rebuttal that and say, well, first of all, you got limited experience and I have like, I've slept with X amount of women. It's still limited. And even if it's a hundred thousand women, it's still limited. Oh, uh, you don't. Yeah, see, I, yeah, because that's what I. That's the way I look at it. Because you don't know every woman, because you've never met every woman on the planet. But also, Just critical thinking. Exactly, but also one thing that trapped me in a vicious cycle that it was hard to get out that cycle. Where it's like, how can this not be true if a lot of my experiences lead me to do that? Like, if I keep touching yeah. this stove and it's hot. When, how many experiences 
do I do I need before I make him a generalization that this stove huh? is fucking hot? Have you ever but, seen a magic trick? Huh, interesting. Okay, okay. Before I even finish, but go, go ahead, go ahead. I, ju I just want to interrupt you because what you're saying only makes sense if you don't consider things like a magic trick, which most people have seen magic. Magic absolutely tricks your senses. Yes, it does. That's why it's magic. Yes, it so, so your consciousness and your, your mind and your thinking can be totally hacked. So to assume that because I've had a bad experience, that means that X, Y, or Z um, is too much of an assumption. It's like it, you're giving too much credit to your senses. Not that your senses aren't important. They are. They're the best you know, data we can get, right? But it's still a limited data set is all I'm saying. So critical thinking is super important when you're taking in that data. If you're trying to look for patterns, for example, unless you can pre predict them with certainty, then it's not true. It's basically you've got something off in your thinking, right? You're maybe you become married to a certain idea. And the idea is that women are X, right? So then you go cherry picking and looking for that. And then you delete all the cases where it isn't. And that's exactly how magic has worked too. And in, in, in a slightly different way with mentalism and all that stuff, it's working off presuppositions and framing and, you know, misdirection and all these other factors that are not considered when the person, if, if a person is just the recipient of that magic trick, right? They're not the magician. They don't know how it works. They don't understand. They're only going to be searching in ways that will be to the advantage of the magician. But the I, truth of it is not what they're perceiving. That's only their perception of the event. So it's a portion of the truth, but it isn't the entire truth. The entire truth is that behind the scenes, there's prestidigitation going on. There's misleading. There's various kinds of you know, methodologies that are used to stay ahead of the person slightly. So they think they're operating from the same plane, but they're actually not. It's an illusion. I love that. And I'll analogy because it makes 100% sense especially you know being in the field of no linguistic you cross over to hypnosis which eventually you cross over into magic mm -hmm. and you're like oh mentalism you see all the magic tricks and when you know how to do it um, once you know the magic behind the magic trick is no long, long no longer no longer if I can speak right magical <laughs> for the user yeah, but he knows or she knows it's not true, and right. I, I like to segue into what you like to tie this back into the manuscript a little bit. Is okay. that first of all, the same thing that got me a lot of women was also the same thing that helped me break the generalization of women, and it's crazy because the same thought product pattern that you just described of the magic trick, if I can hide certain things let me think of well if i'm doing this what is the other person that i'm doing this to are they hiding something because i do believe that you attract people that are on the same level yeah you take minus one m minus plus one that you're on you know right. whatever however anybody want to take that spiritually buys whatever but if if i'm not on the same professional level as you who is a professional you wouldn't even have done this podcast mm. would have first it starts with like the appearance and the spelling and all that and you're like okay we're on the same level i'm not going to waste my precious time so when it comes to relationship i think you sense that not only you have a certain level of connection but that you guys are going to be a good match on an unconscious level mm. right well if I keep going and searching for women in certain locations like nightclubs, Tinder trash can, I know people have found love in Tinder, but to me, yeah. I used to use it like Pizza Hut, where I'm like, oh, I just, you know, I'm trying to meet a girl right now. Boop, Tinder. If I keep using these same AK locations to meet women, I, A, I'm attracting the same level of women as I am because they're probably looking for the same thing. It's context. It's framing. It's framing. B, on top of that, going back to the magic trick, if you see, I don't know if you've been on Tinder, but... I have. Yeah, I'm familiar with it. 
Oh man, you see some I mean, magic. I wasn't very fond of it. I, I, I thought it would, um, I thought that I might perhaps meet someone more or less like me that, that was just um, curious, lonely, friendly, and wanted to, to connect. And I didn't experience it that way. I experienced a lot of uh, strange behaviors and I eventually just took it off because it was a waste of time. I tried for a while, genuinely. I thought, you know, um, if I'm doing it, then certainly there should be, it's logical that there'd be someone else who who would be open to connecting and isn't full of shit. <laughs> Uh, and that probably is true, but, you know, statistics being what they are, um, I happen to be um, the person who just didn't run into that. I, I fully believe that people can meet the person of their dreams anywhere, oh, but, yeah. but it's just not as likely. And, and I think um, I've always been, I've always done better making connections in person anyway. Me too. Me too. Yeah. But also the algorithm for places like Tinder is suited for quick looks because you have limited likes, you got limited time. So quick looks, in and out, it's yeah. really a hookup culture. Can you yeah. find love there? Yeah, I have been to a wedding where the couple have met through Tinder, so you can. But sure. my analogy, and I know this is messed up, I might get hate for it, but can you find... A, a eatable steak in a trash can of course you can mm -hmm. is it the best place to look no like mm -hmm. like you have better chances looking at a restaurant so to right. me if i'm looking for like connection besides physical i knew in my head i would not find it on tinder because it was just purely connection not saying and i don't want to make a generalization saying that all people on tinder like that are like that is just that the algorithm doesn't let you pick a lot of options. You can't pick height, you know, race, religion, nothing. It's just who's next to you, that's who you got. And unfortunately, I live in, near a college town. I see the after effects. I see the, I'm looking for a hookup right now. Right. You know on Tinder. So yeah. is that the type of person that I want to be in a long-term relationship with? Not really. So is the pattern of me trying to find a girlfriend on Tinder, is that working? No. So guys, when he says, going back to what I was saying, oh, limited this, limited that, check where you guys are meeting these women. If you yes. guys see women, I mean, keep meeting, if you guys have slept with triple digits, which is called a centurion, shout out to you guys, that's 100 plus women, and you're like, oh, I've slept with all these women, and all of them are trash, where are you meeting them? Are you trash? You know what I'm saying? Again, you can find mm -hmm. trash in a trash can. You meet the women. It, do an inter inventory of where you meet the women because it's not the quality. Yeah. I mean, quantity is the quality. Absolutely. And, and over. <laughs> four points above where you would be might happen. Also might not last. Or you might, there might be other problems that come along with that um, on both sides. And it could end up being that there's an actual reason for that, that we attract kind of people who are more or less as attractive as we are. Uh, so then, you know, yes, uh, sometimes there's a confidence issue and we, we just don't go for people who we find very attractive because we don't feel worthy. And that that's also true, but beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So the things that we find attractive can shift along the way. And even our own perception of what we find attractive in ourselves uh, can change as we learn to appreciate our uniqueness and to recognize that it's about more than physical looks. It's about the overall impression that we give. Uh, posture makes uh, for a lot of it. Hygiene makes for a lot of it. Um, fashion can make for a lot of it. Humor, uh, kindness, the ability to actually be kind. To people <laughs> to genuinely be kind, not fake nice, but yeah. actual kindness. You want to have somebody who's not going to screw you over, that is, because you might want someone to screw you, but not screw you over. Um, then you need you need to make sure that person is kind because a kind person would rather be honest and you know have you know work out their problem with you or or leave, even if they were to leave you, they would leave you in a more honest way and they wouldn't screw you over. So kindness is a huge factor. If you don't know how to identify kindness, then that's should that should be in the foundation of your dating training. 
how to identify genuine kindness and compassion. What does that really look like? And how can it be faked? How do you see through that fake kindness? And those kinds of things, if you if you're expecting to be successful in having a relationship, you've got to figure that out. That's hugely important. And if you don't, what will probably happen is if it does work out for a little while, you'll end up bonding with that person, which is really bad news because you'll bond with someone who, who isn't really kind. And then you go to that bonding stage where now you're hooked. You've got this chemical addiction going on between the two of you, uh, codependency, whatever that you want to call it. And then it leaves the door wide open to getting really wounded, causing a lot of trauma and drama between the two of you. And all you had to do is, you know, to prevent that would have been to identify that that person was unkind. It doesn't matter how good looking they are. You don't have to move to the trust phase until you've figured out whether they're truly compassionate and kind. You can certainly have fun with them, but to go into the point of trust means that you're probably going to have commitment and you're going to have, you know, things like moving in together and marriage and all sorts of stuff that later on, when it blows up in your face, you're going to be, you know, smack in your head saying, why did I not listen to those red flags? And it doesn't matter whether you're male or female, that's absolutely universal. And I say, male these days I can say every, um, other gender that is that people are self-identifying with these days too because kindness is a universal thing regardless yeah, yeah exactly exactly Gays, heterosexuals alike it doesn't matter and obviously the great follow-up question i got to ask you before i ask you that question um i do want to state that this is what causes some guys to go from discovering the red pill in fact a lot of guys including myself discovered the red pill manosphere after a bad breakup after a bad situation yeah. or a female yeah. um and we're like wow and then we get you know when you're wounded a doctor a nurse a healer is like god sent right so when you you're wounded anything that seems like they can make you feel better that makes you feel better Mm -hmm. Seems like medicine. And I remember, I'm not going to shout out their, their YouTube channel or stuff like that, but it was it was real on the negative side, but there was a lot of useful points, obviously. There was really good useful points, but there was a lot of negativity to it. Um, and just remembering like that whole cycle of, of getting out of that and then being woke and seeing my eyes open. Then mm -hmm. as I met people... I met people who were diehard red pill. I'm never going back. And I found out it's because they went back. They went back from being red pill and they're like, you know what? I'm going to be more purple pill. I'm going to try a relationship. And they get hurt even deeper because they didn't know how to identify certain qualities like kindness. Yes. And yes. that what causes them to be like, I've tried it. And you know what? I, I almost can't blame them because it's like, you know what? He did give them a try. And I've known people do it twice yeah and it's like how can you not tell well first of all what would you tell these people because now Absolutely. these people are, are just like you know what nothing you could tell me is is working but with your specialty and we need to get to your background soon yeah. and all the knowledge you do you know in change work what will you tell that person that's given up okay on relationship? Number, number one and i've said this many times to people i really believe in it Compassion before solutions. Ooh, okay. Yeah. So my goal is to let that person know that, yeah, what you're feeling right now, that disgust or that, that bitterness is a natural response and it's reasonable. It's reasonable. Of course, you have your reasons for being the way you are and feeling the way you are and doing what you're doing. Of course, we all have an internal rationale. So I wouldn't go in with a bunch of, you know, tricks or tools to try to change that. I would first just say, you know, acknowledging what is, is very important. So acknowledge what is fully. Don't just not, don't just acknowledge with your words, but acknowledge with your feelings. 
so that you can get a sense of what that feels like. You don't want to repeat that same ugly feeling again. And that's absolutely sane to believe that. So I would affirm how sane it is that they don't want to repeat the toxic, you know, painful and disastrous choices. Uh, However, yeah, go ahead. I'm I'm sorry. How much, how much would you have them associated in that when they're feeling that? I would have them fully associated, not dissociated at all, because uh, most of the time they are dissociated. That's the problem. That's why they're not uh, really tapped into their intuition very well. They're, They're trying to stay away from the pain. They're avoiding that very thing that has all the, 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 um, the gift hiding behind it. So you've heard that the phrase, you know, feel it to heal it. I don't think you have to always feel it to heal it. I'm not going to generalize like that, but I'm ga- I am going to say that often you can discover really amazing things by first allowing yourself to feel what's going on and not deny it. I mean, you have to associate into the problem in order to understand what the boundary conditions of that problem are. Sure, you could try to do it from out here, but it's not you're not going to get as much rich detail. So once you understand those boundary conditions really, really well, then you can ask yourself other questions that might be useful that are dissociative in nature. Like, who am I when I'm not this problem? Or mm-hmm. when was a time that I felt anything else but this? You know, I mean, that's just a beginning, right? You could go on and on and on, spend the next hour t- teaching that. But yeah, but getting outside of the problem is to realize, okay, now that I know what the problem is, is this universal? No. Do I feel this problem when I'm having an orgasm? No. Do I have this problem when I'm snuggling up with my new puppy? No. Do I have this problem when I'm having an awesome hot shower after a long day and a great workout? No. It's not on my mind. So there are obviously many times where that, or I'm hanging out with my best friends and we're laughing our asses off. No. When you're grappling in, in, in jujitsu, is that what you're thinking about? No. Um, so there are so many other states. Many of them are positive states that you could use as a resource. So you can, you can easily tell that you're being a different kind of person when you're in those other states. So in a sense, it's an identity question. Who am I when I'm not the problem, right? I may be all these other things. And when you're there, what resources do you have readily available to you? Like after a really good rolling session with your jujitsu buddies, when you feel like you did really, really well, don't you sort of mentally feel really sharp? It's almost like the mind and the body get coordinated in some way. And there's a, there's an elation that happens. Maybe your blood chemistry has changed and, you know, your body feels free. And you, if you, if you were to go out after a shower with the boys and, uh, and whoever else is there and go, go have a meal, you'd, you'd probably be walking like you're floating an inch off the ground, you know, your aura is like way out to here. You know what I mean? So um, that feeling is definitely not the problem state. Oh, see, I'm making you sweat already. Because <laughs> um, my brain is thinking because I'm like, yeah, right? I love this. Like, this is, I wish I had this before. I'm sorry, before you continue, I, yeah. let me get this straight. So, boom, guy says, Carlos, I've been there. I, I gave it another shot. And once again, a girl broke my heart. I'm not doing it again. And you're like, all right, you compassion before solution. Love that. I got to yeah, relate to it. Man, I got to tweet that out. And that's amazing. Relate, yeah. relate to it. And that's so important for men to understand because I think we always go into solutions. I know I do. And I don't want to generalize for men, but I know I hear an issue. I'm always like, okay, so what can you do next time to you know solve it? Or what can we how can yeah. we fix it? But instead of hearing them and be like, I feel you, I understand where it's painful. I'm all, I'm I'm not even letting them grieve. Right. So compassion before solution. I love that. And it's the only way they're going to really trust you. And there's the only way they're really going to be open to what you have to say is if, if they feel heard, you know, we are motivated by our feelings, even, even very cerebral people um, have an internal kind of heuristic that happens inside their own process that, that 
you know, has a connection to feeling. It's just that they're, they're not as identified with their feelings, but it's still there, you know? So there's a moment where they say, mm, yeah, that feels right. You know, and, and even a very, you know, auditory digital kind of cerebral type of person still has some connection to that feeling. They know when it just feels right. It's not, not all rational, right? Or sorry, it's not all, um, you know, like a highly cognitive thing going on. Yeah, logical. Uh, be a body feeling. Right, and just a feeling of, of fullness. But uh, point is, if you relate to them first, and you let let them express it, and maybe even help them express it, because a lot of it will be difficult for them if they haven't fully associated into the feeling and into the experience, because they don't have words. Words are powerful. Words are hypnotic. You know, they they help to shape the experience for us. They help us to hold on to and attach feelings to them it's part of the meaning creation process is that we use words so if they're not good at finding words then you can help them to find the words you can ask inductive questions you know is it like this is it like that you know can you think of another example you know so you 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 can use your intuitive kind of situation to mind read uh what it might be and then once they are acknowledging that that's in fact the case, then they'll grab onto that word and say, yeah, it is like that. And their body will look like they've grabbed onto it. They'll, they'll physiologically change. And that's a good signal for you helping them to know that they are in fact acknowledging it at a deeper level. It's not just in their head, right? So that's super important. Once they're there, when you start to begin to ask, well, when it wasn't it like this, because there's, you know, the the meta model in NLP is 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 helpful in this case, right? Um, you know, it can't be a universal quantifier where where someone's saying, "Well, it's always women are always this way. All women are like that." That's that's saying it's universal all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm never understood by women, right? That that's universal quantifier territory. So you can ask that question um, in a variety of ways, but essentially you're trying to challenge that. Mm, so that's say, how you get into. Counter examples in there. Counter examples. Like, yeah. Really? Never, wow, you know, um, really never? even your mom, you know, even your sister or what about, you know, et cetera. So you can, you can get them or can you find another example? You can just literally, you know, put it in their hands. Hey, can you find another example where that didn't happen with a female? You know, has it ever not been the case? There's a million ways you can go about it, but um, the point is that you get them to find counter examples and then that puts them in a different part of their brain. You know, they're not in that same place. So the solution is obviously outside of what we perceive of as the limit or the boundary condition, the problem state. And out there in those other, uh, I guess, metaphorically out in the other space, right? When your awareness is aware, witnessing that there's something else, you're neurologically connected to a type of experience that isn't the problem state. And in that other space, I'm, I'm using the metaphor other, uh, other space here, like as if it's a space, because it feels that way to many people, um, you have access to resources, things that make you feel uh, confident, happy, uh, curious, uh, loved, worthy, uh, warm, relaxed, calm. Carlos, and, yeah. I, I'm sorry, what would be, for somebody that doesn't know NLP, will be an example of resources. Um, Cause when I explain this at work, everybody, I don't do a good job explaining resources okay. at all. <laughs> so resources are things that you can use to get stuff done. Mm -hmm. That's simply put. And when you talk to those people and trying to explain it to them, usually they've heard the phrase, uh, I'm feeling really resourceful right now. They know that phrase. So they just didn't, yeah. they haven't connected it to the way you're using the term resources. Because um, in NLP, we sometimes use the term resources as a nominalization on purpose. You know, it's it's a it's a, a thing that you can't put in a wheelbarrow and you know, not physically, but we're using it like a noun, like as if we could hold it, right? I have a resource. Because usually when you say resource in the world, it means like uh, fossil money. fuels, yeah. money water, you know, and labor and things like that. So, but, but, but resources can also be uh, like learning resources. When you go and you Google something, that's a learning resource, but what about 
uh, connecting with your friends and asking questions. That's a resource. You have crowdsourcing, right? Or you're teaching a class and you ask the class, uh, how would you solve this problem? That's crowdsourcing, right? It's a resource in the crowd. Another kind of a resource can be, um, have you ever had an attitude of gratitude yeah. or have you ever been in it to win it? Mm-hmm. Right. That's a, um, that's a shift in your, per, your personal state of mind, whereby you feel more energy, more encouraged, more inspiration, uh, more focused to get a difficult task done more quickly and more readily. So resources are anything that you can use to help you to get shit done. That's really what it is. And an unresourceful state, by contrast frame here, is stuff that blocks you, makes you feel like you can't get stuff done. Uh, For example, feeling hopeless, feeling like you're not good enough, feeling like people don't like you, uh, feeling sad, angry, worried, anxious, all that. Those are unresourceful states because you don't really get a... You don't get a um, a lot of positive genius yeah. insights. You don't really problem solve very well when you're filled with anxiety. Yeah, like you stuck. Really, yeah, you get stuck. You get confused. You feel you feel blocked. Writer's block or whatever it is you get. You know, the you know stage fright. Right. These are all examples of feeling blocked. And um, when you walk away from the problem a little bit, in other words, kind of mentally separate yourself by going and taking a shower or watching the stupid cat videos on Instagram or whatever, um, or talking to a friend or having sex or going for a workout or going for a hike or doing a yoga practice, you take your mind away from the problem and you relax and your brain actually, uh, it changes. What, what, where the neurons are firing change. You're no longer stuck in the fight and flight, you know, in the amygdala and the base brain stuff, you start to expand into other parts of your brain, you know, like where your prefrontal cortex is and where you can make executive decisions and downregulate the stress response, right? Lots of that kind of stuff happens where you access memories and, and positive experiences in your life and creativity. These are what we call resource states and we can problem solve from there. So with a person who's had like uh, that negative experience, I would first have them associate and then dissociate into other things. And then while they're in that other thing space, that kind of positive resource space, I might begin to ask them to take a look at the statements that they made. Just take a look at the words they used, the limiting beliefs that are held inside the statements that they used and ask them, is that really true? Is it always true? Is there ever exceptions to the rule? And if so, how might you go about finding that? What could you do if you wanted to? All of a sudden, they're thinking about it differently. They're applying resourceful states down onto the problem state. And it starts to resolve the problem because they start to realize, well, I guess I, you know, I feel like I was kind of running a pattern there. I didn't really see that until now or gosh, um, you know, maybe there was another way I could have gone about that. I I didn't really give her a chance or gosh, you know, I kind of knew from the beginning that she was no good and I just kept at it. And I, you know, sort of like being a glutton for punishment. And that's wonderful. I can say, great. Now that you see that, is there anybody in your life that that reminds you of? Like, in other words, at some level, are you kind of imitating what one of your parents did? Did you ever see examples of this kind of pattern elsewhere besides in your own life? Did you see it in anyone else's life growing up? And all of a sudden, light bulbs come on for people. They go, oh, fuck. Yeah. And they start to make connections. They start to say, oh, wow, uh, that person's like my dad or like my mom or, oh, my gosh, I'm being like my dad or I'm being like my mom or whatever. Like, what, However they make that connection they start to realize that sometimes they burst into tears. Sometimes they sweat. Sometimes they laugh because it's such a realization at that point when that light bulb kicks in and lights up, they see their own pattern. It is like a masterclass in yeah. NLP right now. It's, it's, it's beautiful. I want to clarify certain things. And I, sure. I'm so glad that you explained resources because translating it back to the manosphere, 
somebody hears that, and this is why I also have trouble sometimes explaining it to guys specifically, because it sounds like you're talking about that you need more money. And in the manosphere, value is king. So the more money, I'm not getting women because I don't have enough money. So when you said that, in their mind, their presupposition is like, you see, I'm right. He's even he's talking about that. I need to make more money because of resources, female. because the resources. That's gotcha. why I wanted to explain it even more. We're yeah. not talking about external resources, guys. Mm-hmm. We're talking about internal resources. And it's funny because everything you said, if you run it back, if you use the internal resources, you get the external resources called money. Yeah. But we tend to go for the external resources, ignoring the internal resources, getting stuck, ignoring our own personal values, falling apart instead of doing the other way around. That's why I kind of want you to explain yeah. it because it's so yeah. important. I would it say is. this. I've dated a lot of women that were really good looking, that were making way more money than I was making. And I've mm-hmm. dated some good looking women. One, I remember this one in particular, she... She worked for a, a restaurant that was like a knockout for Hooters where I'm at. Uh-huh. Really pretty girl, homeless, like living out of her car. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So, um, and I say that because a lot of guys would be like, oh, I need money to get women. I'm 5'3", and I've dated women that made six figures where I was barely making, I was living with my moms. Um, but I've also dated like, some pretty girls that were broke. So we got to stop generalizing like that. It's not the yes. money that we need, guys. We need, in my personal opinion, and I think Carlos might back me up or he actually has more knowledge than me. So he'll correct me if I'm wrong. If we find our deep core value thing that creates internal happiness with us, that will provide enough fulfillment where we get things in my life in, in in our life we start solving issues i feel so fulfilled now i'm not the richest i'm definitely still in debt still full-time job but oddly enough funny enough i'm getting more opportunities to make more money and things are yeah. funny enough falling into place because i found my passion so yeah yeah I, I would agree in general um you know i don't want to dismiss the truth which is that we need to have a way of paying for things and and money is a resource for that purpose. And it does make our lives easier and it it does bring more opportunities, but it's basically, you know, what I'm, what I'm emphasizing is that our internal resources are most important because they're what help us to get the external resources. Exactly. And, and it's important to, to not neglect the need for external resources and, and even to acknowledge that, um, you know, in general, when you're dating uh, and you want to have fun, you need uh, to have at least some resources. You don't have to, to do all of the things that society tells you you need to do, but you'll still need to, to buy certain things, you know, and you need to, uh, you know, if you ever want to cook a nice meal or go to a nice restaurant together or go on a vacation together, you're going to need some, some uh, uh, available funds to do that with. Um, and if you want to think about maybe eventually having a long-term relationship that leads to having a home, <laughs> you're going to need to have money for that too. Uh, or what if she has a kid and, you know, the, there, there are ways in which you're kind of both contributing to the family life. You know? So money is important, but, uh, and we should respect that, but, but so I'm not denying that I'm just saying, it's important to focus a lot of our resources on what makes the money. Yeah. 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 Cause uh, and that's a pitfall that a lot of people are falling into called the high value man. I'm not valuable enough right? Uh, because I don't make X amount. I'm supposed to be making this much at uh, this year. And it has a positive intent. Like, Hey, money makes relationships much, much easier. They're not the main focus, but like you said, nice vacation or just the the ease knowing that i could cover our bills if we have a baby or you know things like that it makes it easier not feeling stressed not feeling stressed yeah when you have more money um there's a tendency to be less stressed you're less worried and they've they've actually looked at the faces of people 
Mm-hmm. I've done some uh, examinations. You may have seen this before where they look at people who are really well off versus people who aren't. And there are some generalizations that can be made, at least from the data that they've crunched so far. Uh, obviously, any study can be flawed, but from from what I've seen in multiple uh, types of studies that, yes, uh, you know, having more available income does mean, in general, a little less stress. You're less worried about things. So it is important to keep working on that. Uh, exactly. Sure. Don't get for lost sure. in it, guys. But like at the same time, don't be a bum. Because I, I see guys even at in the comment sections or at work that, you know, they had no life. Their life, life is not good together. They're like in their late 30s and, you know, overweight and all that. And then, but they have the audacity to complain that, you know, women don't like them because they don't make enough money. And I'm like, well, it's because you don't have anything else to get her, guys. So it right. has to be a, a equilibrium between both. It like, does. Come on. And, um, you know, you look at some of these, uh, you know, seduction workshops, seminar kind of things, and, and you look around the room, uh, or even if you're just looking casually from from the um, the comment sections of various forums, and it's pretty easy to mind read what many of these people probably look like. Um, and, and when you have seen examples of that, especially it kind of confirms that that's true. Uh, these are not men who hold themselves with good posture. They're not men who necessarily have good oral hygiene or who, you know, pay attention to their sort of overall, uh, appearance and, uh, even their olfactory scent of, you know, making sure they're well bathed and, you know, that kind of thing, or not overdoing it with too much cologne or something like that. You know, it's a balance. You're being really nice. AK, there's a lot of scrubs. Yes. A lot of pawns that yes. want queens, their pawns, and instead of making the work to make themselves kings, they're like, nah, they should love me. I want to ask you this before we go into, like, how do you how do you qualify others in the sense of relationship? Because you said, you know, yeah. the kindness. How do you find that? How do you test that before it's too late? Before I ask okay. that, what is your opinion on the phrase, love me for who I am? <laughs> yeah. First of all, um, yes, love me for who I am. But can you love that person for who they are? You know, it, it goes both ways. It's a two-way street. Um, it's one of those things that we talk about, like, I want someone to love us for who we are. That's true. But don't we also want them to love us for who we could be? That's a, yeah, I'm going to write You know what I mean? Because like where, where's the growth? Where's the growth? And I don't know about you, but for me personally, I have my own unique desire for um, a harmony between feeling totally comfortable and feeling totally like I want to improve all the time. I want that balance between the two or the, the harmonious relationship between being okay with what I have developed and being grateful for what I've achieved, but not being stagnant. Mm. Mm. You know, relationships oh. are there to reflect, you know, re- well, they're there for a lot of things. Relationships are there to support relationships are there to uh, create bigger things together. Relationships are there for, you know, mating purposes and sex and affection and positive reinforcement and all those kinds of things. But they're also there to help us to become uh, better and better all the time, better than we were yesterday or last month or last year, Um, better in specific ways, uh, kinder, more thoughtful, more aware, uh, more socially intelligent, uh, perhaps more affectionate, uh, better at being affectionate, um, maybe more skilled, you know, like like Napoleon Dynamite, I got skills. You know, skills. nunchuck skills, you know, everything, uh, cage fighting uh, skills. No, but we need skills, right? So, and, and men and women both want to kind of cultivate themselves. If, if they're not cultivating themselves, they're not interested in themselves enough. I'm not talking about the opposite of that, where people become or total narcissism, where that's all they care about is themselves. But you should be interested in who you are and and find that your growth process is important to you. And if you're in a relationship that kind of, uh, f- encourages you to stagnate, then you might want to rethink that. It's good to be in a relationship where you do feel like 
bringing out your best, but necessarily, you know, you don't have to be in a relationship where someone makes you feel like you're never enough. That's also the other polar opposite. You need to find a balance. Nature is all about finding its way through opposites all the time. You know, the Tao Te Ching talks about, you know, the, the way of nature, the way of power, the way of virtue is to follow the way of nature, to see, to observe, to explore. So here we are back at that original quote, right? Um, mm -hmm. As we acquire knowledge, let it be things that help us to grow, not things that um, block us from being who we truly are, right? So we're growing all the time if we allow ourselves to, um, to see those opposites in action all the time. Uh, I'm currently in a, in a really, really supportive, wonderful relationship. And I feel so blessed that I have her in my life. She's just a gift, a big gift in my life. And one of the things I like about her, um, her personality is that it allows, she allows me to feel safe and accepted and good enough, really good enough, but it doesn't lull me into not trying or becoming mm -hmm you know, resting on my laurels or something like that. She makes me want to be better all the time. It's not because she's harping on me or anything like that. It's because I just want to impress her. I want to, I want her to be tickled by things. I, I find great uh, value in making her smile, uh, you know, and, and I see her growing too. She's not stagnant either. I see her working hard on herself and it's so beautiful uh, to see that and to create a safe environment where she knows that I'm not criticizing her or, um, you know, picking on her or something like that. At the same time, she knows I'm observing her. And when she wants feedback, I give it to her and it's honest. I'm gentle, but it's honest feedback. So I have to say it works really, really well between us because there is that um, balance or that harmony that I was just talking about works really, really well. So you asked about how do you determine? Yeah. Well, I was about to ask you that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm going to tell you, I'm going to share with you my four coordinates, I guess you could say. Um, I've never seen anyone else talk directly about this in this way. So this is my creation um, or my discovery, maybe is a better way of putting it. And I'm developing it right now, but it's basically, it starts with recognizing, you know, what are the things that bring us together first? The first two, let's start with one, is attraction. Attraction, AKA beauty, beauty, attractiveness. So let's be honest, male or female, what catches your eye? What draws you in? It can be a, a variety of things, but it's gotta be to a level that inspires you and makes you want to take action. Otherwise, they're just like, meh. Second thing is um, more to do with personality. I call it intelligence or um, a tr or personality, like, re sorry, relatability, my bad. And it has to do with the personality. And it has to do with the way they think. So you could say intelligence, but it sometimes throws people off if I say it that way. They think, oh, the person has to be a certain IQ level or something like that. There are nine different types of intelligence at least. Mm -hmm. So it just matters that it works for you, that it intrigues you, that it works well, that, that you feel that you can relate to this person. So now you have sort of the attractiveness and relatability category taken up. That's pretty easy for most people to figure out. Where it gets difficult is the next one. And this one I call kindness, compassion, maybe understanding, but kindness and compassion are the most important there. So first of all, kindness. Let me break that down. Kindness is not niceness, at least not by my definition. Niceness is compulsory. And it tends to be that we are nice so that people won't dislike us. It's very away from oriented. I like how you said that. Yeah. So no more like Mr. That. Nice Guy, right? <laughs> Um, yeah. it's okay, okay if you have some niceness. I mean, that's just a social patterning that you've learned or whatever, but in general, you got to look at that. It's very important. Is that person just being nice? Well, that means they may not be speaking the truth to you. Mm. They might be unconsciously deceptive to you. May not be intentional, but it might be an unconscious deception. And the second thing is, um, 
niceness can sometimes be walked over and that's not good for a relationship, not for good for either side, really. It may seem like it's good for the person who's walking over someone, but in the long term, it's not good for that person either because they have no one of strength to back them up when they need it. So you need a certain amount of strength. And that's why I'm going to kind of relate that to kindness because kindness is strength. You have to be strong and empowered to be able to do a kind act for someone because kindness is inconvenient for you. Kindness is an act of generosity and gentleness or uh, assistance towards a person coming from a place of empowerment within you. So we don't say in society, we don't say, don't confuse my niceness for weakness. We say, don't confuse my kindness Kindness. for weakness. So that kind of tells you that at least unconsciously, people recognize that there's a difference between niceness and kindness. And by the way, if you show someone your prized artwork and they say, oh, that's nice. How are you going to feel about that compliment, right? It doesn't feel good. So yeah, there are some contexts where someone could say, hey, she's really nice or he's really nice. And that would be just fine. But in general, you can see the problem with it, right? Like, 100%. Now, however, someone says, wow, like, like my girlfriend, she's very kind. I really mean that. She is kind. She has a very kind heart. And when I say that, people know what I'm talking about. They get a feeling from that. So it's related to the idea of compassion versus empathy. Compassion versus empathy. Yeah. So empathy is there, is our you know ability to at least imagine that we are feeling what another person's feeling, right? Uh, deep a deep sort of relating, right? And compassion is is what I would say, uh, the next octave up from there. It's, it's taking our capacity for relating and feeling what another person's feeling, or at least imagining that and translating that in a very healthy, um, uh, supportive way that empowers you at the same time as you're helping them. Can you give an example of that? Like that, uh, yep. That, yep. that, uh, Pokemon evolving into its higher form. Absolutely. You, know, you said, um, compassion not compassion i'm sorry um empathy we started with empathy and then yeah, turns to compassion yeah absolutely so if if i'm if i'm empathetic i'm pathetic <laughs> um i've heard that before yeah yeah i never really understood what they meant by that though. Yeah, uh, I haven't heard that, but uh, but I'm a word guy, so I just kind of came up with that in the moment. Um, I didn't know if anyone else said it, but I, it does not surprise me because it's an easy pun or an easy wordplay to make. It came from a bad guy. In a, I can't remember exactly what, but I remember a villain said that. Okay. He's like, I don't want to be... Uh, he was like going to take over the, the, the building, and they're like, don't you have empathy? If I'm empathetic i'm pathetic he said that and okay like, he gangster kind of guy or something like yeah, that yeah something like that, that makes sense because mm-hmm. you know in in rap music there's a lot of rhyming and a lot of wordplay so that totally I makes love sense. it um, I, I personally hadn't heard it but it, but it makes sense there's some really really great rap lyrics i've heard um so that, that makes really good sense but yeah so so if someone falls down into a, a well and they break their ankle and they can't climb out if you were being empathetic you would kind of need to throw yourself down the the well with them and break your leg too otherwise you're not being truly empathic empathic there right you um need to recognize that now both of you are down in the well and you're both stuck it's the same as someone's hurting you've got to hurt too to show them that you're feeling what they're feeling and we sometimes assume that that's good, but it's, it's an instinct. Okay. And it's probably good that we have the instinct because it it prevents us from doing harmful things to people and stuff like that. It's good to have the instinct for empathy. Um, But if we stay in empathy, and I think most people will be able to relate to this. If you stay in empathy, you can't help the person you're stuck. You're miserable. You're not in a resourceful place. So what's the the way to do it is to say, oh gosh, you fell down the well. I care about you and I care about what happens to you. I care about your well-being. 
I want good things to happen to you. So I'm going to um, see what I can do to assist you right now. And I want you to know that you're not alone. I'll get help. I'll help you. Uh, here's a rope, tie it around your waist. Uh, you've got this. You know, have no fear. You'll be through this in no time. Uh, I know you're scared right now. It's, it's, I even understand how you might have happened. Anyone could have fallen down in that, that well if they were in your state of mind. Maybe, you know, you weren't, you weren't noticing it. We've all had moments, you know, I get it. We all have reasons. So I'm not judging you. I'm helping you because I care about your well being. So that's compassion. And we can notice that if we feel empathy in a relationship, it can do one of two things. One, we could become incapacitated by our empathy because now we're both feeling it. Two, I could notice that I'm going to feel that way. And because I've done this before, I learned to shut off my feelings. And instead, I try to fix it right away. You know, you should just do this or do that. And it's a way of creating an emotional wall. So I don't have to feel what you're feeling because it's overwhelming. And so a lot of people do that to protect themselves from feeling. But there's a middle way. The middle way is, the, in my opinion, the most holistically beneficial way that both people benefit from. And that is to recognize when that signal of empathy kicks in, that it's because you care about them but that you don't have to fix their problem. What you need to do is open your heart, open your physiology, be still, witness what's going on, reflect, how can I be of service to this person in the relationship best right now? Does she or he need a sounding board, someone to speak to about this, someone to bounce ideas off of? Could I invite them into a solution by simply asking, hey, um, I've heard what you've said. I've reflected back to you uh, everything that you've told me. Do I have it right? Is that what you're feeling? Okay, great. Um, would you be open to hearing a solution for that? Um, or would you let me know if I can do something for you to help you? Please let. Please know that I'm here and I'm on your side and we're in this together and I'll do whatever it takes to help you because you're my best friend or whatever it is. You know what I mean? Like it's the sense of they're not alone. You understand. You support them. And also you're not letting them ruin your mood because what they need is not for you to feel miserable. I guarantee you that most people who are feeling miserable aren't going to feel better because you're feeling miserable too. They're going to feel better because you stay with that soul, that heart lit up with, with positive energy, and you're not trying to force it on them. You're just a source of light. You're not trying to blind them or, um, you know, make them distracted from their pain. You're just being present in your own light and you're being a source of, uh, you know, being able to work through it together. Mm. And then they will be stimulated by your example. And then because you're willing to do what, you know, they say, hey, you know what, would you mind holding my hand right now or whatever it is? Um, sure. Absolutely. And then you're doing that and you're, you're fulfilling everything that the empathy was supposed to do, but more. Mm, so when you see awful. when you see this reflected in a person who, um, you know, the way they treat the the waiter, the waitress, uh, the way they treat the homeless person on the side of the road, or the person on who's whacked out on drugs next to them you know, while they're in the street or, or the way they respond to um, someone near them that's hurt or sick. When you start to see their behavior in those contexts, you can start to detect whether or not they're going into empathy or compassion, whether they're being nice or kind, and also whether or not they are virtue signaling, meaning they're doing things to make you believe that they're so kind. Wink, wink. Look at me, how, how compassionate I am. Wink, wink. In truth, they're virtue signaling. They're trying to get you to think that they're better than they are. And that's manipulation. Intentional manipulation or unintentional manipulation. And you mm -hmm. got to be aware of that. That's the 
that's the place where the, the pattern can break down if you don't keep vigilant to make sure that it's real compassion, real kindness. So you can see that over a period of time and you may take different periods of time depending on what your life is like, but there will be situations where you're in pain and you could use a friend and the way they treat you in those moments will let you know whether or not they're compassionate. It has nothing to do with the words. It has everything to do with the way they show up for you. So they could say that they're, you know, a care bear full of light and all this kind of stuff. And I just love everyone. And I don't judge people. And I'm la, 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 new agey nonsense. Then when the real shit happens, they're being, they're doing the spiritual bypassing where they kind of deflect you instead of actually, you know, take, you know, staying in the, in that dark room and saying, you know what, I, I get it. This is dark here. I totally get it, you know, and I'm, I'm here and you know, what can I do? And they're not losing their shit. Right. So that's super important. And then the final category. Oh, well, do you have any questions about that category first, before I go to the last one? Carlos, listen, if I owe list all my questions will be here all day. Cause I, okay. for me, I love this. Like yeah. the best part of having a podcast like this is that I can't wait to hear it myself. Yeah. To write down what I didn't catch. Yes. But no, I don't have any questions right now. For I'm now. Okay, loving great. this right now. Yeah. So the final category is availability, presence, mm. availability slash presence. So availability has um, at least three categories that I can determine availability of uh, physical. Like that person is able to be there. They don't live 10,000 miles away and only see you once every two years. <laughs> uh, whatever works for you. That's totally personal. However much you need them to be. The next is emotional or mental presence. So when you're there with them, are they always on their phone? I mean, are they able to actually listen to you finish a story or do they constantly seem like they're somewhere else mentally? Like they're not able to be present with you, right? And then the third is social, social presence. So if, if they don't ever even think about integrating you into their friends, that it's not important that, that, that their closest friends meet you or that their family meets you, or another application could be they're actually in a relationship with someone else and it's not okay what they're doing. That's also social availability right? If those categories are not satisfied to your preferences, because everyone's preferences are different, then you cannot go to the next phase of relationship building without a huge problem waiting to happen. So if you do those four things perfectly, that's your litmus test. This is like the, the first stage is like, um, uh, attraction and connection stage, right? You can move to the next stage, which is intimacy and commitment. Sorry. It's a, yeah. My alarms no. at night go off so I can try to get some sleep. Yeah. But, um, so that's basically it. If, if you, if you notice and just ask yourself, and this is a good thing for people to think critically about every situation like divorce or awful boyfriends or girlfriends or whatever, every single one of them, analyze it in that template and ask yourself, did they actually fulfill all these? Or did you just move into being their boyfriend or girlfriend or husband or wife? or roommate yeah. before you were a hundred percent sure about these four. And there's no time. Would you say there's a time limit on there? Or there's no time limit, no time limit. No, it's just whenever you figure that out. So, so it can happen it out, in six months. If you want, it got been six months. It got been six weeks. It got been yeah. six years. Yeah. How often are you seeing them and how many contexts and moods are you seeing them in? So this is the dating phase, right? Uh, and then more of a commitment stage is the second stage, right? So I you, think dating stage, you start to explore intimacy, but you haven't completely bonded to the point of, yeah. you know, 
you know, you can't leave them, that kind of feeling, you know, that feeling of, oh my God, I'm so engrossed, right? You don't want to get to that place until you've figured out that these four are okay. And you said like, you don't have a working name for it. Cause like I'm writing as much as I can. And I accidentally came up with a acronym for it. I call it the K cup because it's like, huh. K, you know, kindness, compassion, understanding, and then availability and presence. You said it was either or you have yeah. to say K cup is presence. And then it's broken down into the four different availabilities, physical, emotional, mental, Social ability, build, uh, availability, and presence. Yeah, the to me, I call it the K cup. I like, I love, I like it. Like it's it. that's yeah, that's nice. Actually, what was I calling it? I was calling it the uh, the four quadrants of that's way better. Uh, <laughs> the four quadrants of relationship. So of a romantic relationship. Four quadrants. Of- the four quadrants yeah. of a romantic relationship. So those are like the the initial get to know them stage. Mm. it's the litmus test that lets you know whether you would be comfortable and safe getting into a trust commitment relationship with them. Now I got to ask you, we have to go through your background. Yeah. You never even finished that. I know we just started talking. Uh, yeah. Um, we definitely got to go through your background, but before you get there, you just to finish, try and finish this jewel of a nugget up. The virtual si- signaling, like how can you tell besides the obvious, the obvious to me would be like, if every time they do something kind, they post it on social media. That's, that's one. That's yeah. one. What will be the other uncommon un- one or the sneaky ones that guys and women, but this is a guy channel, will watch out for um, in your opinion, your experience and your knowledge? Covert narcissism. When they are really into love and light and um, that's kind of like what they, the way they talk all the time about love and light and um, Mm. they, they, they will talk about their spiritual understandings and they kind of go on and it's really charismatic and they're really lit up by that. But there is a sense that they don't, really feel very curious about yours like that yeah like they're just they're just assuming that they know more about that than you do without even exploring it it's a kind of a strange assumption to make when they when when uh, even even if you're like let's say you're you're 10 years older than them or or 20 years older than them right and they're still talking like that it's a, it's kind of a, it doesn't mean they're a clinical narcissist necessarily, but it means that they might be, <laughs> you know, like w- the, the term narcissism gets thrown around a little too easily. Yeah. These so I'm not trying to, to, to say that um, from a diagnostic standpoint, but, but in a way, um, you know, I feel fairly convinced that the examples I've seen were clinical narcissists, just different types. Uh, and there are different types of narcissists, by the way. Mm-hmm. And A lot of people don't realize it. A lot of us, all of us could under some circumstances display certain elements of what would qualify as narcissism. That doesn't mean that we're clinically narcissistic. Usually you have to satisfy like, I don't know, eight out of the 15 or something like that things to, to, to classify as a, as a narcissist. And it can be tricky to figure out. And there's some argument to be made about it, right? So I'm, I'm not going to get too into the weeds with that one, but I just wanted to make that clear that I, that what we can generally say is that um, that self-absorption, there's a lot of self-absorption in the conversation, is another sign that they're not interested in your take on those deeper talks, the deeper spirituality. And, and when they, oh, here's another one. This isn't necessarily proof positive, but it's another indicator. Let's say a conflict comes up and they either um, become viciously defensive, viciously angry and raged on your defense, which could be a show, right? They're not actually reflecting and hey it's not really my battle but i'm really sorry that happened to you you know that kind of thing how can i support you that's different but that sort of vicious 
angry defense that they, they, they can maybe even lash out and do harmful things to people, bad sign. Another one might be that they avoid being committal about what's right and what's not right. Like they, they, they have a sense of, well, you know, I, I don't want to get involved or, oh, you know, they kind of, they're scared of actually empathizing. Yeah. That's and that's a, another sign. For people who love the 48 laws of power, and I'm a big like contrarian, I would say, when people read that book, because to me, they, they vir- either virtual signaling when they read it in public, like I'm reading this 48 laws of power. I'm so smart. But they yeah. can remember even one law out of it. Yeah. Uh, but for the people who are really reading it to like get some substance for their benefit, guys, he just mentioned one of the best laws that a lot of narcissists do. And I think I want to say, don't quote me on this, correct me in the comments, but law 37, whichever it is, but never commit. Never mm-hmm. commit because then that way you could play both sides and you can never right. be on a losing ship. Yep. And that is perfectly what narcissists do. No, it's not yeah. really either they overcommit in wrong times. And I've seen that. Unfortunately, yeah. I've seen in the military where I'm like, I think she is playing this guy because they just met and she's getting crazy, like she's getting extremely mad and it's not her battle. A couple of weeks later, come and find out she's a narcissist. Yeah. Or they don't want to commit and they're like really loosey goosey on almost anything, especially when you get them to like, what are you looking for in a relationship? Well, you yeah. know, they do what I call the matrix. The backpedaling. I used to do, the backpedaling. I used yeah. to do it. And it works a lot because you get the buns without having the messy, like, I'm not, I'm trying to play the field. Yeah. You get it. But guys, girls, it, it, it's not a good sign. The little backpedaling. Yes. And here's another one. Um to protect you, you need to look carefully at whether or not they're love bombing you or not. I did an episode on that. Yes. 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 So true. Because that can appear like, you know, to an unexperienced or inexperienced um, uh, person that like, wow, they're so kind. They're so compassionate. They're so loving. Right. And you got to be careful that to, to just really look in context, maybe separate yourself and really ask yourself, is this really an example of that? Or is it some sort of heated kind of infatuated sense of, of wanting to just get a full on dopamine rush and get an oxytocin rush from this experience? What's this really about? Yeah. You know, she always asks the question. Any tips to, to see that? Because I would say personally, I had a family member that um, it seemed like they were being love bombed really bad. And I, I still have my antenna antenna up but it was that person's nature mm-hmm. and we come find out like wow that person really just likes to well power people yeah what one again why does narcissism work so well is because it looks so close to what is what what does, yes. what is true it looks almost like it's counterfeit personalities that look yeah. so close yeah so why do people accept uh, fake uh hundred dollar bills because it looks fucking close mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. so but 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 one of the things that, you know luckily there are ways to tell um uh, i've already mentioned some things that kind of create context right but but one of them if someone's love bombing um so there so there's going to be um a lot of the love bombing so if it happens a lot, doesn't necessarily mean that person is narcissistic or lying, but if it's combined with non-committalness, that is a dangerous combination and probably an indicator, right? So if, if someone doesn't like to be pinned down with their ideas, they get, they get upset by it mm-hmm. and it's, it's just pure logic. Like, why wouldn't you be pinned down? Of course, this means that because in context, that made perfect sense. And then they're like, oh, well, no, and they can't actually come up with a really good reason for it. So that's a, that's a kind of like, they want to leave wiggle room for themselves all the time. Or for example, um, they're using pseudo spiritual um, kind of truisms I know to justify right. their them. thoughts and behaviors rather than really yeah. examining whether that's true or not. Uh, and, and also uh, they, they might borrow, say stuff from um, a popular um, spiritual teachers like Deepak Chopra or um, Eckhart Tolle, you know, 
who do say some interesting things, but they'll take them out of context and, and, and they'll behave as though what you're saying somehow applies to this lesson about maybe there's no, there's no, there's no um, permanence in anything. You know, I can never say anything for sure for permanent because there's no permanence. Right. And it's like, we're only experiencing life in a vessel and all that dumb shit. Yeah. Yes. Oh my God. Yes. It's like, yes, it's true from a certain perspective when we're talking about um, things on a, on a particular level, but when we're talking about uh, within the context of feelings and love and things like that, that's sort of um, counterintuitive to be saying things like that when someone's bonding with you and, it's an odd thing to say unless you invite them into the discussion. But if it's if it's used kind of like as a way of blocking rather than as a way of going, well, you know, I appreciate what you say, but did you think that on some level, like you know, there 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 is there is an end to life, so so life itself is impermanent, and therefore everything we do has a certain impermanence to it. That's different. That's that's kind of exploring the idea. It's inviting the person into a conversation. It's not being used as a wall. Mm to kind of block well on the other hand love bombing so that's the that's where it gets subtle yeah. you're doing those two together that's a sign mm. oh. it's a clear sign uh breaking of promises repeated breaking of promises is another sign of a lack of kindness because kind people always think or tend to think um more about the repercussions and how people will feel once something happens, so they consider the ecology of their choices and words are part of choices. We choose to say words. So uh, if there's a lot of broken promises, that's another indicator that a person is not kind. You know, one thing I got to say, I wish ecology itself was more well known in just all type of change work. Yes. And- to, to explain ecology, again, I'm going to let the expert explain it because I've sure. been doing NLP for a little bit. But it's it when I understood ecology to my level, of course, it's different levels. I was like, wow, like this is so important. huge. Yeah, yeah it's freaking huge. It's it's so important. Um, you know, in, in that case, uh, the eco- ecology is asking yourself, how is this going to affect my life, all the categories of my life, including my body, my health, my psychological health, my emotional health, my spiritual health, if, if you will, or philosophical health, and the people in my life that I'm connected to. So my family, my friends, my romantic interests, uh, my children, my uh, um, colleagues at work, um, and then further, the planet and the environment itself. And um you know, the, the social groups at large. So it's at least considered that how each thing that we're doing is related to a larger system. That's all. And when we think like that, it's easier to um, make choices that we can feel proud about later where our future self says, Hey, good job. You know? Uh, So ecological thinking would absolutely prevent a lot of the problems that human beings face right now. If we just think ecologically. Yeah, I, how is this going to affect everything? Not just how is it going to affect my personal bank account or my chances at getting laid tonight, <laughs> but everything. How about her tomorrow and the next day? How about the way you feel about yourself tomorrow and the next day? Do you know what I mean? So it's that bigger picture. So ecology is very much a part of kindness and compassion. I would argue that. Um, if those other things were present, like I was mentioning, the sort of love bombing with the non-committalness and the walls that come up, all of that, that it's more niceness than it is kindness. Mm. Mm. So it's reflexive because they can't help but want to be liked. Narcissists yeah. love to be liked. We all do, but narcissists are special. It's for, it's important for them to at least see themselves as great even if they're not so interested in having people adore them all the time, although they do love that uh, it's also important for their own self-concept to feel that they're that way. They're so special, you know, they have to be special, Um, but they're detached from their 
core to some degree, the core that loves and connects and um, wants to be free and explore uh, is a little bit blocked. It's like they can't really detect their own core. Instead, they're running software that's not really innate to them. It's it's almost analogy is almost like they're, there is someone else or something else running the program, uh, not their core self. Because if their core self were there, they would feel connected to other human beings in a different way. They would feel uh, that they they would hurt when other people were hurting. They would have a capacity for empathy. Mm. So the very fact that they're not, it means they're just slightly divorced from seeing and living from the core. And therefore anything that you would do, the more skilled you get in NLP and stuff like that, that truth bombs. So if, if you will, that will kind of like break through their defenses. They can get violently angry instead of going, wow, thank you. You know what I mean? They're going to go and explode at you because it's like, that's the worst thing for them is to actually be forced to see and witness their own self, their core to know, or not even that to notice that they are not living from their core, to actually have that pointed out to say, well, you're, you're running <clears throat> uh, third-party software on there, honey. <laughs> That's another sign too, Loki, because one of the reasons I've seen good relationship and even uh, I'll be a little transparent. One thing I, I, I got me into a relationship was um, being able to handle the truth, a truth bomb and be like, thank you. I didn't notice that. And then seeing them actively change it and keep the change. That's the key thing because anybody can fake yeah. it. Um, and on both ends of the relationship, we saw that and we're like, oh, okay, cool. We don't we take feedback well. That's great. Yeah, that's the one thing that got us together. Because on the opposite end, I've seen that where people get a hard truth and they become violent. Yeah. And it is nasty. And they get, it's horrible. Um, yeah. Man, you're a wealth of knowledge. Like, I want to ask more questions, but we need to get into your background. <laughs> we need to get into, like, why do I have you here? And why yeah. do you have so much knowledge? With that said, I mean, we've been, and we need to... <laughs> We need to come to a close at some point. We need to, that's what I was about to say. We need to come to a close because, wow, yeah. it's been a really, really great episode. I can't wait to rehear it, read some of my notes, great. study my notes because that's the whole thing about this podcast. I want to yeah. become an expert in 10 years and not and not pay a tuition to do it and right. just sit here and talk to people. This is a smart way to go about it. I mean, I, I appreciate the ingenuitiveness, uh, the... Uh, um creativeness of of what you're doing i mean this is a great way to do it absolutely appreciate that thank you yeah um of course uh there will be some things that you'll you'll only get through a deep immersion but what's cool about what you're doing is you can now choose more carefully which deep immersion you want to do and you'll save money that way you won't save money like in the sense of, I won't have to pay anything to get to the certain level because there's some things yeah. you could, like I said, you can only get through deep immersion um, where you're spending, you know, two weeks deep diving into something. Um, that's the only thing I will say, caveat. But but yes, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, sift through the, you know, the material and separate the wheat from the chaff. Yeah. That's, so that's, especially that's what I'm really good about. This is a hack, what you're doing. And by the way, I also have this hack. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll link it in below too. Yeah, I absolutely adore this hack because for that reason and also for the reason that I'm just, like I said before, I'm, a, I'm an avid lifelong learner. I'm voracious at it. I love learning. So and you sound like the same kind of, we're simpatico that way. So, so this is absolutely the way to do it. Podcasts are awesome that way to get yeah. deep conversations with people that you wouldn't normally get. So yeah, okay. So background, um, I, I'm gonna try to go through it. Um, there's a lot of stuff. So just in general, I'll start. I'll start with you know, as a child, um, I started early with an interest in um, human potential and personal growth. Um, I didn't think of those terms, but that's exactly what I was doing. I was very, very interested in spirituality and philosophy and 
my mind and things like that. So I began very early asking about things that um, interest me. Uh, I was four when someone asked, what are you going to be when you grow up? You know, oh, how cute little question to ask a four-year-old. And I wanted to be a, a Kung Fu master. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, I was a child of the seventies, born in 1971. I'm 50. Mm. So. Oh, you don't look, wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. But um, so Kung Fu, the series and Bruce Lee and all that stuff, that was what I was raised with. And, and even the black exploitation films and all that, you know, that I'm that all that kind of arena, right. That's kind of like what inspired me to do martial arts and kind of develop myself a little bit. There's a lot of that stuff. Um, even to this day, if I hear certain kinds of like soul or funk music, I just, it might get shivers, you know, I could feel it. Um, and so that was one aspect of it. And, you know, I was raised in a, in a religious environment, um, Catholic on both sides, uh, divorced family, quite a bit of like emotional and physical trauma uh, from, from that. So I had stuff to work through. Mm. And that was another, I would say, component where the problem is actually, or the obstacle is the way, right? As Marcus Aurelius put, I'm, I'm super into um nah, stoicism. I, I got meditations in my yeah. on, on my phone right on my on my yeah. bookshelf uh I'm facing my bed right now you said a couple of existential quotes too and i'm like yeah. man, i gotta have them back on absolutely man and um so so they they my my parents my brothers and sisters they they had a nickname for me one of them at least was uh the walking question mark Ooh. because I was always asking questions. Why, 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 why? And it annoyed the hell out of everybody, but it's very much a part of me to continually ask that question. I've always been that way. So my sisters introduced me to the idea of lucid dreaming, particularly my sister Pilar. I asked her about it and she said how to do it. And I started to lucid dream. How old were you? Oh gosh, by then probably five or six or something like that. Man, and, I know a kid that's five. That's uh -huh. about oh, no, he's six. That's talking about lucid dreaming, and I was like, "Hmm, wow." And okay. it's it was because I needed to resolve uncomfortable experiences. You know, uh, when, when I was uh, staying at my my father's house, he he passed away last year. When I would stay yeah. at my father's house because we had a divided um, household, I slept in this extra room that was kind of like his den that was dark and dusty and it had human skulls lining the the room with like indian skulls and and uh, it was just a heavy kind of environment for a kid and so i felt like uncomfortable like like there was an, a, a darkness around me all the time and so i used to do things i just came up with my myself creative kid you know i i, I would let myself fall asleep and then i would wake up again like no, let me rephrase that. I would feel as though I was falling asleep and then I would wake myself up before I fell asleep because I wanted to see if I could toggle between total awakeness and sleepiness and bypass that blank spot that happened every day because I was so frustrated that when I woke up, I don't remember that moment when I fell asleep. So I would well, I was pushing did you myself to explore. Why did you want that spot though? Like, what did you because want that? Somehow I got it convinced in my mind. I got convinced of the idea that that um, I could break on through to the other side, that I could figure out with my mind, with my will, that it, there was some way of of seeing through reality. Now at six. Yeah. Oh word. And <laughs> and I continued to do that through growing up. So so I naturally, anytime there was an occult movie on. Or I would have to be in a library and there's an occult section there. It would be me diving into it and noticing. So, you know, about the NLP filters, right? So I, my deletions, distortions, and generalizations were all about the hidden, the occult, the, the nature of things, what's going on, like what's, you know. So as I began to actually study Kung Fu, and I did that for, you know, many decades, um, I dove into Taoism meditation, Qigong. Uh, my mother taught me yoga and yoga meditation because that was her path. Uh, and I started to practice ceremonial uh, magic and, and things like that. I started, you know, getting books, I'd hide them and I'd practice in secret. 
Um, and, and so I was learning how to ritualize my meditations and ritualize my explorations. And then, of course, that led me to learning about psychology in um, uh, high school. Um, I had a teacher who would kind of teach me things. Then he gave me books to read on abnormal psychology. And uh, he would start to hypnotize me. And eventually I, I um, uh, started to read books on hypnosis and play around with it, I guess you could say. Um, and I still didn't, I wouldn't say that I felt very proficient at it because I was just constantly trying to explore and learn more about it. Eventually, um, I studied Ayurvedic medicine and I went to the California College of Ayurveda. So I studied uh, the Indian traditional medicine and the psychology. Uh, what does that entail? Can, can you, I'm sorry, can you explain? Yeah, it's, I, it, 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 I don't know what it is. So Ayur, Ayurveda is a, the traditional medicine of India. It involves, um, they call it the mother of all medicines uh, systems. It's kind of loosely connected to Chinese medicine and Tibetan medicine. Um, it uh, has an esoteric kind of background where, where um, the body has these different energetic types and we digest differently and food affects us differently. And when you learn about that, you can adjust the diet and, and take in special herbal combinations to help you heal and, and heal your digestion. And, and there are psychological and spiritual components to it where you learn about uh, chanting certain mantras and using certain colors and certain essential oils and various kinds of movements. And it's a very, very large system. I could never encapsulate yeah. it in just a couple minutes it's huge i could speak for hours on it so uh, we the whole system i'm sorry we definitely have come across uh remnants of it like i'm gonna say maybe yoga probably is connected to it or yoga is connected to it um and vedic astrology is connected to it um acupuncture uh, acupuncture acupuncture is connected to it yeah gotcha Absolutely. all right yeah. so that's that realm yeah, it's that realm of alternative and complementary medicines, right? From the East. Okay. I studied so the some Chinese medicine. Is Indian specifically grandfather specifically for Indian. all of them. Yes. In and area. in the martial arts school that I trained at, I was trained in uh, like a basic level of Chinese medicine, even some rudimentary acupuncture and things like that. Um, I decided not to do Ayurvedic medicine as a thing. Um and I decided to begin studying NLP. That was about, God, I don't know the exact, maybe 14 years ago, 13 years ago, I don't know. And I started learning about NLP and I just kind of would learn as much as I could from different teachers. I started kind of hopping around and learning their methods. Uh, I noticed there were a lot of things that were similar about it, but I felt there was some stuff missing as well. Mm -hmm. um, I sensed that because I had trained in martial arts to a fairly high degree at that time. And I just felt like there was something missing in it. Um, eventually I became aware of um, my current mentor in NLP, who's just a cut above. He's phenomenal. And uh, he's also a friend and um, he's opened my eyes to a whole world that I kind of suspected was there, but, but he's shown me that it is, it's like a real thing. And he's one of the only people who does the really long form old school trainings. Like 30 days? Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're usually about 28 days and it's spread over like three or four months. Um, he has a condensed program that's 21 days, but with some optional night classes. Uh, so it's, it's very, very immersive. Um, and unlike most NLP classes, uh, there's no guarantee of passing. <laughs> um, you know, but he's got a lot of integrity. So he just pretty much, he's so into being kind of a standard bearer for the, for, to make sure that NLP doesn't lose its potency, uh, that he says, you know, Hey, when you pay him for a course, you don't have to pay him again a second time for that same course. You can take it again. If you need to take it as much as you need to, in order to pass the course, to go on to the next level, oh. which is great. Cause you know, he's basically saying, look, here's my standards. Uh, they're tough, but they're fair. And if you can't do it during this training, you can come back, no charge, and you can, you know, take the test again until you pass. He just really wants people to get it. And my experience with him is everyone who's trained with him is just really phenomenal. 
Um, anyway, uh, he's in Melbourne, Australia, so he's not local. <laughs> oh, but I've had What's him. His name? Um, his name is James Sakalos, and Sakalos with a T, T S A K A L O S. So sorry, I, you know when you said, "Oh, you need an immersive program." In my head, I was like, "Yeah, I'm really trying to save up for this Australian program that's like 20 days." One. Yeah, because I remember his name was so hard to spell when I was yeah. listening to a podcast, and it's I was like, Greek. How do you yeah he doesn't look greek <laughs> but that's i didn't know that <laughs> it's I a greek last name i can't like i meant that's my goal for uh 2023 Tw all this year's jujitsu competitions and then next year i want to go to melbourne and and do that immersive program you um, are a I wise man that's the good that's that's worthy of of the time and the um uh, effort to to make it there so so yeah he he's the real deal and um i've never met a better trainer than him wow. uh there's some really great trainers out there but but i've never met anyone who was better at training than him he's like a ninja trainer <laughs> he knows how to get you to um understand things that you didn't even think you would be able to to understand uh so yeah he's he's great but anyway um great pool player player too <laughs> hmm. uh, uh, so, so he's been a big influence on me. I trained in some NLP and some spiral somatics, which is the, um, his personal creation. Uh, well, it's his teacher's creation. He is a co-developer of this system, which is a way of looking at the body, uh, body language and the body movements, the body posture, uh, in relation to the spiral memes that are related in spiral dynamics. What? So, yeah, spiral dynamics is a whole other thing, um, but it's a way of understanding change. Um, and well, spiral dynamics is understanding change in big groups of people over long periods of time. And spiral somatics is looking at the changes of what motivates a person in, individually in any given moment, physically. So what's, what's motivating them in that moment uh, can give you insights into... Uh, how you could communicate with them better, how you could persuade them better, how you could help them through a tough spot in their life. There's so many applications for it. Oh, that's why I'm learning NLP the proper way now. Because if I knew that, if I knew all that earlier, I yeah. would have been a monster. Oh my God. Absolutely. What? That look that sounds like extreme advanced calibration, it sensor is. security. Yeah, all of that stuff. Uh, and it's its own thing. Uh, so you don't have to have done NLP, like you don't have to have a background in NLP to do it, but it absolutely works well with the NLP. Uh, so I did that. I, I, I took uh, Jonathan Altfeld's uh, genius mapping program, which is uh, what he used to call knowledge oh. engineering, which is a whole modeling process. And, uh, and, and he's also a, a dear friend and a wonderful human being and an amazing trainer as well. Uh, you had him on your your show, right? I did. Yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. first episode. That episode, I love that episode. In fact, I, I was trying to watch it again because his I, his knowledge was amazing. I have to link that in descriptions below because that it's was awesome. Amazing. It's really awesome. I mean, for for so many reasons, <laughs> it has it has also a lot of different applications to it. It's not just one thing, but yeah. So that's been incredible, um, and. Uh, Hypnosis trainings for me have been uh, diverse. You know, I've I've trained in uh, hypnosis with Mark Cunningham. Uh, he went to Thailand with him. Uh, done done a lot of that with him. I've trained with people like uh, James Tripp, who's also a dear friend mm. and a really amazing um, next level thinker. You know, someone who really really um, asks the question that was on the sort of the tip of your neurons that you didn't quite put it into words and you're just like, yes, oh my God, that's it. Yeah, yeah. So he's pretty brilliant that way. Um, I trained with the uh, Freddie and, and uh, Anthony Jackwin, so the Jackwin family. Um, and of course, a host of other things, uh, you know, to core transformation with Michael Stevens, I'm uh, sorry, Michael Watson, as well as his uh, online uh, uh, virtual hypnosis program. And um, I've taken stuff with Scott Sandland, who's the, the former uh, or the, the founder of hypno thoughts 
and I've taken some weekend courses here and there. Just like there's a whole lot of different kind of trainings. I don't want to get too exhaustive into the weeds, but the other category I probably should mention is um, the work with uh, uh, Chase Hughes. I heard so Chase, that name before. Yeah, he's he's the guy who's kind of famous right now for like lie detection and persuasion yeah. influence yeah. that kind of thing. Uh, he's got a you know strong military background, also a Navy guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I did, I did a year long course with him plus some other stuff, um, his master, master behavior program. Um, and then I can't neglect to say that Vipassana because Vipassana meditation was a big, huge thing in my life too. That's the, um, the technique that the Buddha used in order to achieve enlightenment. So it's a 10 day silent retreat and oh i've heard of that yeah it's a a practice it's pretty it's pretty powerful it can transform uh people it's really amazing i heard it's not for the weak of heart because when it says silent it's like i I heard i heard it on a podcast years ago but obviously no electronics no nothing but i heard you can even talk you you can't even make eye contact you are to look peripherally at people not allowed to make eye contact, not allowed to write notes, not allowed to talk. Uh, You are to only focus on the practice at hand uh, and only at the stage and level that they're teaching you at. You can't bring other practices into it. Uh, You, you know, if you're a yoga person, you're not even supposed to be doing yoga. You're supposed to only focus on The Vipassana, it's about 10 or 11 hours of meditation every single day for 10 days. You eat like one meal a day, unless you're a beginner, you can eat uh, one meal a day. Plus they give you a second meal, which is really just tea and some fruit and that's it. And it's, it's amazing though. It's, it's not about that. That just facilitates you having a powerful learning experience where you're not distracted. But the technique itself is ex- extremely important because it allows you to train yourself to see inside, to witness and to gain insights through watching the compulsions as they come and go and separating yourself from those compulsions, whatever they may be. Uh, it could be a compulsion to scratch your nose or it could be a compulsion to scream at somebody who pisses you off, right? They're both compulsions. But the ability to step back and really witness that and practice the skill of witnessing those compulsions so that you are not dominated by the compulsion, that you are operating from a level of volition that is guided by wisdom rather than guided by uh, the moment, right? Well, let me rephrase that. Rather than guided by your compulsion in the moment. The compulsion in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, you become extremely present to the moment in all aspects. Your sensory acuity becomes very well developed during Vipassana training because you're focusing in on sensations as your guide to what is happening in the moment. Even so though you, you're not talking to anybody, you still yeah, can like... When you don't, yeah, when you don't talk to anybody, there are still constantly changing uh, sensations all the time. Just even sitting here, if we were to be totally quiet and we turned off all the lights, there would be sensations like where, you know, my left hip bone is touching the, the, the chair because I've got one knee up higher than the other. That's, that's going to get uncomfortable after a while. If I were to witness that sensation, uh, there would be a compulsion to move. But if I'm not in charge of my choices, then I'm in, then the compulsions are in charge. And to the degree that our compulsions are in charge is the degree of, uh, of roboticness that we have in our life. So if we have patterns and we want to be able to break a pattern, it's essential that we could witness what that pattern actually is and exert control over our choices within that context. And it makes total sense why it's, complete silence because the silence you can't mask the compulsion 
you can mask in everyday life. Yeah. Because you got countless senses going off, rings, bells, whistles, all that. There's constant distractions. But when yeah. there's nothing but your thoughts, your minds, your sensation, now we can start separating. I can see why it's total silence because you can start separating. Is this me or is this like the automatic compulsion I keep doing that I'm trying to break? Yep. Man. So, so it's huge. Sometimes people's health problems go away. That's um, where I heard it from. A guy had a happen. major health problem. Although it doesn't, it's not the goal. The goal is to see yourself and to cultivate your capacity to see yourself. But along the way, you may notice that there are sort of, um, I'm using a metaphor here, psychic knots, you know, uh, uh, they call sankara, right? The, the patterns, ingrained patterns uh, that are compulsions that can contribute to um, health problems. And when you release that tension, sometimes at the root of the health problem you have is tension. So when you release that tension, a lot of times the problem goes away. It just, just kind of as a byproduct. Hmm. So that kind of leads down to the next category of what I focused on was um, a training in something called family constellations. And sometimes we call it systemic work or systemic coaching. Okay, I've heard of that. Yeah, the so, name at least, and that's a whole journey unto itself, um, an intuitive journey. Um, it was based on the work of Bert Hellinger, who was a French um, missionary. I'm sorry, French, a German missionary, <laughs> of uh, who was um, a um, a Jesuit who went to. He was sent to uh, Africa and studied with the Zulu tribes. And they brought him into their uh, sacred, secret shamanic ceremonies. And he learned things from them, which he then took some of those ideas and he went back to Santa Cruz in the late 70s, which is uh, where he met Virginia Satir and probably Richard Bandler and Milton Erickson and all those folks. And he got kind of immersed in integrating what he learned with the Zulu shamans and what he was learning in Santa Cruz with all this human potential movement folks. And they took all of that and he went back to Germany and began to work on it. And what he ultimately developed was something called family constellations where um, you get a group of people who agree to do this kind of intuitive work, like a form of drama therapy where uh, people are representing other people or people are representing other qualities or things. And they're in a room or in a circle and they're kind of in, infused with the quality that they're representing by the person who's doing the constellation. So it's like they decide that's what you are. And then they move you somewhere in the circle and then let go. And then they move all the different pieces, the chess pieces on the board to where they feel it should be. And then they step back and sit with the facilitator and watch. Each one of those people, whether or not they know who they're representing or not, if they, re if they know what they're representing, um, that's not blind. If they don't know who they're representing and they just, like the, the person who's doing the constellation didn't tell them, that's called blind. So those people will then begin to move, speak, make noise, lay down, dance around, uh, pick on the other people or avoid the other people. And they create, there's sort of a pattern, a kind of a cacophony, a chaos, if you will, that starts to culminate in a pattern, which they call a constellation. And it gets interpreted by the facilitator and the person who's doing the constellation. And it could represent uh, a missing father that wasn't there in their life or uh, a child that was unborn, right? Or a war and you know the trauma 
of, of being in the Holocaust or whatever it might be, right? So those things, and it becomes a way of facilitating people to work out their problems and to resolve things that they couldn't normally resolve because that person's dead or whatever. But it can also be for things like, you know, a lost item or um, difficulty healing the body or difficulty with a business that just isn't taking off because you start to have people representing things like potential or uh, conflicts or resistance or, you know, uh, the customers, right? So you can have people representing those things. And then when they interact, you get to interpret it like a living tarot card reading, I guess you could say. Mm. And what happens is profound. When you do this a lot over a, a, a period of time, the level of intuitiveness that opens up for everyone who's there in the circle, even the people watching, is incredible. You start to intuit and understand and resolve things just because this constellation was done, if it's done properly, if it's facilitated in a really good way. So I did a lot of that. And you can do this kind of one-on-one -on -one as well. Uh, and, and in that case, it's not a constellation, but it's still systemic work. And there are certain guiding principles in it that help you to interpret your interactions with people. So I would say nowadays, even though I have a very strong hypnosis and NLP background, um, I would say that systemic work is in almost every single session that I do, like probably 80% of my sessions involve systemic work because I'm starting to see how the systemic work is this larger context and the NLP stuff is the way I can understand and express within it. And of course, yeah. hypnosis is very much a part of it too. But uh, so it, I guess you could say the way I work these days is that it's kind of integrating all those things that I've learned and it's becoming, I guess the, my own Carlos style of how I, how I meet people and show up for people in, in, in the context of a therapeutic healing session. But it goes back to like the martial arts thing. Cause yep. Like, you know, growing up with Kung Fu movies, that's what got me into martial arts, Kung Fu movies. You yep. always have like that school that like has a certain style and then the other school has a certain style and then you have like that vagabond student that's like he got kicked he might have got kicked out of one school then he he kind of learned something from this school and then at the end of the movie he like beat all the schools because he combined a little bit of everything from each school or he made his mm -hmm. own style perfect mm -hmm. example i like think of is um old school movie jackie chan snake in the eagle's claw shadow i can't remember the yeah 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 i know which one you're talking about awesome yeah. movie but um he mixed his master style with like some snake he saw you know and like he was he was able to spoiler alerts for like a 30 40 year old movie but he was finally <laughs> able to beat like the bad guy that was beating all like his master and he beat the you know everybody before him combining different styles and i I have to admit, I'm jealous because as a person that is a lover of learning, mm. I wish I could download what you learned or at least be on that track where I'm taking the course here. Like I'm excited for Australia, but that's still next year. Um, and I still have to like financially plan for it. Thank, thank goodness. I know the date that I'm gonna be going. That's Good. already like situated. Good. But financially, I got a plan for it, and just keeping up with all the courses that I want to take. That a there's not enough time, and not like right now there's not enough financial resources to take yeah. all these courses. Because I know, man, it can cost a fair bit. I mean, uh, no doubt. I mean, but but there are some some wonderful smaller courses that you could take too that are not that expensive. Um, like, um, you know, uh, uh, Connie Ray Andreas. Yeah. Yeah. So she's you know wife of of uh, Steve Andreas who passed uh, a couple of years ago. 
Um, anyway, there's still she's, that whole group. The family is still teaching. Um, I took her, uh, you know, the wholeness process. They're coming to wholeness uh, work. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. you know, not expensive, really. Uh, totally worthwhile as a methodology to practice. Uh, kind of meditative, in fact. Or core transformation. I took that as well, and that that was something that really um, works hand in hand with the, with the wholeness work. So that's, that's kind of its own innovation from NLP. It's not actually NLP proper. It's not classic NLP. It's its own thing, but it's a development from NLP. And that's pretty, pretty interesting. So a lot of those things. So I'm actually uh, talking about the Andreas is I'm actually taking, um, a course from, it's from, uh, Steve Andreas is, uh, uh, transforming yourself. I don't know why. I'm looking at the book right now. I don't know why I had a book. Yeah, for it. you know, oh. that's a book that I have that I have not uh, opened and read. But that it's, book is what caused this podcast, my relationship, and my new jujitsu competitiveness came from uh-huh. that first. Came, it came, shout out to Damon Cart, awesome YouTube channel. You just released another video, but he's a student of Steve. I know Damon. Yeah, he was his like personal student. So his course is phenomenal. It's affordable. And that's how I first got into back into NLP. And I just can't wait for the live courses though. Cause it's online. It's live on Zoom calls. So you get a coach, but the one on one, like Yeah, I know. Yeah, um, yeah. That course, phenomenal though. Phenomenal. That's yeah. great. That's really great. How did you know, yeah. I'm sorry. You was a- I was excited. I didn't know that 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 there was the transforming yourself uh, course available. I'd, I'd, I'd never seen it, so that's cool. yeah. He, he's the only uh, Damon Carr is the only one that's like that. Uh, Steve before passing uh, authorized to teach it. Gotcha. And, and then he turned it into a course. The book and the course are if you have both, it's awesome because you can. It's like study study guide. Um, cool. Still not even finished with it. Still mm-hmm. not even finished with it, but I've had so many transformations on the on the way. Mm-hmm. Carlos, wrapping it all together because this has been a great, great episode. Can't wait to re uh, listen to this. How would you first? Who are you targeting? Like who are you to? Uh, who is your the people you're trying to reach? And how would you describe what you do to fix their issue to them? So I always have trouble with this question. <laughs> um, I would say in general, I mean, the best way to do it is for me to just chunk up. Um, in general, um, the people that I serve are people who are looking to grow and develop themselves beyond where they're at. And some of them, a portion of them are people who have um uh, difficulty because of trauma and they're looking for another approach or a way to navigate that perhaps even heal it and access resources inside um so that tends to be the kinds of people that i that i attract to me so there are a lot of people from all walks of life i I literally have uh, doctors and dentists and psychologists and uh, stay-at-home moms and uh, entrepreneurs and business owners and athletes and uh, uh, students, you know, working on anxiety or, you know, I would say probably a good, at least 60% of the people who come to me are working on anxiety. And then the rest are other things, uh, but, you know, anxiety, I can include confidence, public speaking, um, you know, uh, dating stuff uh, and, there's a a good portion of them that are working through relationship problems. I'm, I'm fairly good at helping people to emotionally connect and feel through their problems and find better ways to relate um, and to shift their values around what's most important in a relationship so that they can actually grow. Um, And then I'm doing consulting. I'm, I'm, you know, keynote speaking for Salesforce and, uh, there's a German company that I regularly consult with and do courses on everything from the five-step sales process to, 
emotional and mental resilience and toughness getting through the pandemic to um, how to handle strategic communication with people from uh, a variety of cultural backgrounds, you know, Asia, India, you know, uh, various parts of Europe and South America and Africa and America in, in various parts in Europe, you know, how do we adjust our communication? You know, so I kind of like to keep a portion of what I do on the corporate level because it's interesting to me. It's a challenge. It's fun um, to consult that way. And a portion of what I do is kind of one-on-one coaching uh, with uh, folks. And then a portion is what I would call developmental uh, coaching because it's helping people to develop into their leader that they want to be or mm. the kind of parent they want to be or the kind of you know business owner that they want to be. And so how I approach that is first through um, a phone call. I have people reach out to me for a free introductory initial consultation. That's usually about 20 to 30 minutes. And then in that conversation, I just focus on the number one thing. Can I be of service? If I cannot, then I refer them out. But in most cases, it's just a question of asking more questions and, and finding out more about the problem. What do they think the problem is? It may or may not be the thing they think it is, or maybe it's just related to it, but it's a good place to start. What do they think the problem is? What are they doing that they'd rather not be doing? Or what aren't they doing that they really feel that they need to be doing? Those two things. And in what contexts is it a problem or not a problem? And once I determine that, then I just go over my process, a little bit about my process, how long it takes and uh, how long the sessions are and what my fees are and how to get started. And we open up our calendars and we begin, we schedule something. Um, and then when they come in, they decide after they've had the first session, they figure out um, how many they'll need. I don't make them decide before they've had a session with me. I like people to, to be armed with information and to really feel like they've, they're making a congruent and ecological yeah. choice. Ecological and like guys. <clears throat> oh, I need to get some more water. Yeah. The e- e- ecological part is where a lot of self-help is missing where mm-hmm. I've seen it when I was a personal trainer. Fortunately, none of my clients, but fellow personal trainers where uh, the wife is getting in shape and the husband doesn't want her to get in shape because it's a jealousy factor. Like you might leave me vice versa. Mm. Um, but with the self-help, like the, the, maybe not even the word ecological part, maybe it's like, not ripping people off, like making them decide on a congruent level, I really need to change. And I believe this, what Carlos has to offer can help me change. Therefore, I'm going to make a conscious decision to do it instead of like using all the sleazy sales tactics to sell something. And because I'm a byproduct of that, like I think one of the questions that I sent you was, uh, you know, what do you think needs to change in self-help? I don't want to get into that now because I I don't want to, go into the tangent but one of them for me was that like offering medicine without diagnosing the issue yeah knowing your patient just trying to get their wallet and unfortunately i've been a victim of that and a lot of people people who want to change have been a victim of that yeah Yeah, and i can say just real briefly without going on a huge tangent just to just to kind of address the the surface of that one of the things i think that is the problem in salt in in this industry are a lot of uh, very selfish uh, short-sighted people that are, are are just out for their own king, yeah. you know, um, like what you said about offering solutions without a, di- a real diagnosis, but also I, I, one of the reasons why it's awkward when people ask what my background is, because it's like, there's a lot of things I've done, uh, to list them all is, is tiring and exhausting yeah. for me, but not only that, but it probably exhausting to hear. And it's not stopping. So it's not going to get any shorter. It's going to get long. The list is going to get longer. But why is that? It's not because I don't think I'm worthy enough. It's not about that. It's about that I really have a high value of wanting to, to bring 
really useful things to the table. And I want to do good. I want to help. I do. And it, it creates less uh, incongruencies when I charge because I need to feel like, okay, I am bringing a lot. I've spent a lot. I put a lot of hours into this. There's a certain amount of fairness inside of me that I feel I need to satisfy. Yeah. And um, I'm a helpful, loving, kind, sincere, creative person, but sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes you need tools. You need specific tools that can actually help you. And that's why I continue to drive into this kind of stuff because I want to be able to handle a multitude of types of issues. I want to be able to provide a lot of solutions. I may never be able to provide solutions for everything, but the more I can do that, the more I can step out there and, and um, get more and more creative with what I've known, what I've learned. And yeah, that's I, a lot about that. And a lot of the personal growth gurus out there, they don't necessarily have as diverse of a level of training, but they are, they've got heaps of confidence, like loads and loads of confidence. It's almost ridiculous how much confidence they have. And what I've discovered is many of those people are just excellent presenters yeah. They're all about how great and awesome they are. And they pick the perfect demo subject to come up and then they do their little magic and wow, look at how awesome I am. And that, okay. To some degree, that's everyone has to do that. Cause you need to get a good clean demo for people, but yep. that's like all they do. They're like a one trick pony. They do that, but then they don't actually have a lot of experience with coaching. They say, oh, I, I charge $1,000 an hour for coaching or whatever. Like, really? How much actual coaching do you do? It's probably mostly not that. I'm pretty sure that I have more coaching hours than most of those people uh, because that's what I've done. I focused on that. And it does make a difference. I don't think I overcharge. I think I charge a fair rate. Uh, I could easily charge more than I'm charging. I'm, I'm in... Newport Beach, for Christ's sake. Uh, you know, I got a Newport Beach, a physical office in Newport Beach. Yeah, that's not uh, cheap. <laughs> I should technically be charging twice what I charge, but I, you know, it, it's still too much for some people. And I get it. I get it. But yeah. It, and it's understandable because, first of all, you're not going to cheapen down your price. Yeah. Um, but second, also, like, they, they don't understand the true value of it. Yeah. Because... And you, you, I don't want to get along with it, but we know real value in change work and fluff. Mm -hmm. It's cheaper to go with the real value because it's it takes less charge, time. Less time. Oh, Way less time. I mean, Way think about a standard. Now, now, I don't want to like knock all psychotherapists because that would be ridiculous. Man, there are hundreds of thousands of them mm -hmm. uh, there's definitely going to be some really amazing ones out there but but what's the complaint that i get and this is again it's a it's a it's a small data set it's the people who contact me right their complaint is often that oh my god 15 years later is still asking me how i feel about things and i just nothing's changed it's like okay but where's the difference okay i happen to know that there are psychotherapists out there that are not just doing that that are actually getting results with people. I mean, my friend, Paul Leslie is incredible. <laughs> he's incredible. He's a psychotherapist, but you know, to be fair, he's also really unique and brilliant. And he is interested in things like NLP and he's done some of that kind of training and he's an Ericksonian hypnotherapist. So oh, he's wow. not your average psychotherapist, yeah. you know? Uh, but most of the people that I know have gone to, got their MFT license. They, 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 they've satisfied the, you know, the rules to be able to get their license, but yeah. then, you know, side by side, when I listen to them coaching or, or the kind of questions they ask, I think, wow, they could really use some meta model in what they're doing. It would save them hours and hours and hours of, of work. Um, you know, or they could, they would really do better if they knew about anchoring right now, because they're totally anchoring that negative state right now. And they don't even know it. I mean, there's so much of that kind of stuff. And I don't mean to sound holier than thou. That's not where I'm coming from. But let's just be honest. Sometimes you see something that's an error and you're like, that is an error. It's a problem and it's common. I'm up. I'm, 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 I'm on mistakes. I make mistakes too, but come on. Like, 
So, so that's, that's what most people are saying. Well, yeah, I could, they can pay, uh, you know, $50 copay or $20 copay, or they pay even the full rate. And they, that psychotherapist might charge $185 for a 45 minute session. Some of it may be covered by insurance. Some of it may not be, but how many times are you going to have to go? How much longer do you want to stick with the problem and hang on to it? If it takes you three years, even a year, even compare that to coming in five times, 10 times and being completely free of that and several other things. Yeah. That's the gift and the curse of NLP though, because it's so effective and it's not hyperbole that it's so effective that people really don't come back. It's quick. So yeah. I could see people say, you know what? I can't make a living off of this. Let me stretch out the cure into a treatment sure. longer and, you know, charge people that way. And I see it yeah. in the manosphere all the time. And these people yeah. don't have any type of NLP. I can't say they don't. The majority of the high figures in that manosphere, majority of them don't have any real therapy or coaching training. They just right. like, I have life experience. I'm older. Some of them are not even older. I, I, there's 22 year olds given dating a life advice at 22 where they can't barely even rent the car. But yeah. Uh, it, yeah. Uh, and then they, they, they have the audacity to charge. And I, and I know it's hard for me to even say, I don't want to knock people's hustles, but when it comes to this, being a victim of it past, tense i don't want to label myself like that and seeing other people get screwed over where they really need some change work breakup a death a suicidal tent and then they, you got these pedal peddlers in the manosphere and other areas where they be like oh yeah you're hurting right now here's a solution that doesn't work mm. but it's cost you x amount you don't have the money put it on the credit card it's fine and then they leave out empty-handed those people right there I'm not a violent person, even though I love martial arts. I'll beat the shit out of those people. <laughs> yeah, because you, 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 I've seen people who are suicidal. Yeah, like, I think I'm, I'm, a, I'm gonna buy this course, and I'm like, don't buy that course because you'll succeed next time you have an attempt. So that's my bad. I didn't want to get into it because I got a big rant on it. I know. I could, I could, I could join you in that rant. I've seen a lot of that too, and I've seen people getting taken, taken advantage of, and it's, it's not. It's not pretty. Um, I take one of the reasons why I like to have that longer conversation in the beginning um, is to make sure that I don't feel like I'm one of those people, you know, that I feel like, okay, I feel very good about inviting this person to schedule a session with me. I feel good about that. And that's important. Uh, if I don't, uh, it's really not uh, good for me or them. To continue sometimes people have actually tried to insist on coming when i when i felt like it wasn't a good idea and i've had to respond by insisting that no uh, i really don't feel this is a good right now for for you or for you know that you need to find this other person i will be happy to refer you and i'll refer out um, it's important saying no is important it's a very important boundary in fact, and, I, it's so, I'm sorry, go, go ahead. Cause that, I was just going to say, and, and, and if you don't say no, you'll learn your lesson. I'll say that and I'll end the self-help rant on, on that. Because something you said that was so key is that you had that talk beforehand. So not only that you're not, they don't get the sense that you're a charlatan, but right. to me, it also puts me at ease because come to think about it all the people who had that talk beforehand have either had great substance to give me either i wasn't ready to receive it or had substance that were life-changing and mm -hmm. like the first one i remember getting into the sales uh marketing course great course worth its dollar i wasn't ready for it so mm -hmm. I can never, but they had that like beforehand. Now I kind of wish they asked some different questions at the end because I think I 
they allowed me to trick myself into thinking I was ready for it, but I wasn't really ready uh, for it. Yeah. But I can go back anytime because it's already paid for. And it's a That's great, cool. great course. Um, and Damien's of course is great. And knowing your knowledge, and this is the thing, I know your knowledge because I study NLP. It's similar mm-hmm. to like a patient who can read behind the doctor and be like, oh, he knows how to do brain surgery, this and that. Where the mm-hmm. average person is like, I don't even, how you know that? It's like, oh, I can tell by his credentials. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. see the work in him. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a no-brainer. But for somebody who doesn't know the power of your credential or the power of NLP, I'll say, and I'll back you up with this, guys, before we wrap it up. The I've been to therapy. Um, my family has been to therapy and stuff like that. And same thing where it's like a year I've never been to therapy for a year. Let me clarify that. But I've seen family members or and or friends who've been to therapy for a long time. No mm-hmm. change. Now, is it the therapist? Is it them? Good question. But that's the same pattern I've seen multiple times. And yeah. when I got into NLP, I was wondering why Richard Brander, first of all, was making fun of a lot of therapists and psychology. Then mm-hmm. I started understanding why. Why is that? Why take a year, and Damien Clark could even testify to this too because it happened to him, to try to fix something where you can use an NLP process or a another, it doesn't have to be NLP, it could be hypnosis, it could be just another change process that might not be as popular mm. or alone and do it in a fraction of those at that time. Mm-hmm. I'm living proof. My sister's living proof. Fraction of time little bit NLP process, boom, change our life. This yep. podcast, everything, my relationship. It didn't take me six months. I've only been doing NLP for five months. Mm-hmm. Does that mean that it's going to take you guys five months? No. I'm just saying that I can vouch for why the pricing is so much and how effective these processes are. Yeah, absolutely. But Carlos, we can keep talking, man. I love this conversation. Where can people reach you at? Definitely going to have you back on. Yeah, sure. Um, so first of all, you know, one way is obviously by by uh, finding me on Yelp or on my website. Uh, the name of my business is Hypnotherapy Breakthrough. Mm. So if you go to hypnotherapybreakthrough.com, that's one way to do it. Um, if you search on Yelp or Google Business, you'll find me there. Um, you know, and of course I'm on Instagram, hypnotherapy breakthrough. I'm on Facebook, hypnotherapy breakthrough, <laughs> Twitter, hypno breakthrough, <laughs> a little different because they have a shorter name on that one. Um, and of course, uh, often people will just go onto the website. You can find my phone number on there and, uh, you could just give me a call, you know, uh, I will return calls. Uh, and I have a YouTube channel. It's just hypnotherapy breakthrough. Imagine that it's also called hypnotherapy breakthrough, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I wanted to share that, that I have a podcast that's about this topic too. It's about hypnosis and, uh, psychology and healing and a lot of things. And they might, we do, we do end up talking a lot about NLP and hypnosis. It's called authenticity show. So mm. Um, you know, I would just invite people to check it out. It's, it's, um, a lot of interesting topics. We've been running it for about six years, me and a co-host. And, uh, we talk about all the things that interest you, all the things that are kind of, um, the things that we discussed during this talk. Um, and it's not monetized. It's just a free resource. So yeah, yeah, that's it. I'll link his, uh, one of my favorite, that episode about mapping with uh oh yeah man that's a really Jonathan good, Allfeld. really good yeah. episode it's his birthday today by the way <laughs> oh wow wow happy yeah. birthday yeah happy birthday Jonathan shout out to Jonathan yeah shout out to although Jonathan. where he is it's probably midnight by now so it's probably the next day but yeah oh exactly. it's midnight so yeah <laughs> okay it's yeah midnight here so yeah okay yeah he's a, he's on the east coast he's in, in uh, uh Florida oh yeah yeah so it's on my side well Carlos, thank you for having me here. We totally got off topic. We never got to jujitsu and co- competition, but <laughs> right. I think in my experience, having the mental clarity and healthy relationship, personal relationship 
has taken my jujitsu to another level. Am yeah. I winning competitions? No, but not yet. You know, I haven't competed. I got a competition coming up soon, but just my practice in in my overall, like just overall being in jujitsu is just improved knowing that like afterwards I don't have to worry about stress or anything because mm -hmm. people go to jujitsu to get away from stress. It's yeah. to not only get away from stress, but be stressed less when you leave jujitsu. Mm -hmm. And I have to say it's because of my mental clarity. So if anything, at least we tied that back into that. So absolutely. Yeah. hundred percent. So thanks so much. I'll You're welcome. You. It was great talking with you. Definitely. We'll do it again sometime.